Happy New Year. It's 9 a.m. here in New York City. I'm Shauna Smith alongside Madison Mills. This is Yahoo Finance Live, and here's what we're watching this morning. Well, it is the first trading day of 2024, and stock futures are falling on a downbeat start to the new year. Now, this comes after the S&P 500 ended 2023, just shy of a record high. Meanwhile, Treasury yields are gaining as investors look to economic updates, like minutes from the Fed's December rate decision, and the December jobs report all due out later this week. And all eyes on Apple this morning. Apple getting hit with a downgrade. Shares of the tech giant falling this morning after Barclays downgraded the stock from equal weight to underweight. Barclays citing concerns over Apple's iPhone volumes in the new year and of course waning demand uh, for those upcoming products like Macs laptops and iPads as well. And the road ahead for Tesla, the world's most valuable automaker delivering a record number of vehicles in the fourth quarter and that was enough for the company to hit its 2023 target of 1.8 million. We're looking at shares up just about six tenths of a percent in the pre-market. Let's start off with some of our big stories of the year and stocks are starting 2020 in the red Nasdaq futures in the red here this morning after Barclays downgraded Apple. We're also taking a look at two moves that are catching our attention in treasuries. We've got yields moving to the upside and also oil is in the green on escalating tension in the red sea. Now we have got team coverage for you. Josh Schaefer standing by at the interactive and Jared Blickery is in our newsroom. A ton to break down today but Maddie let's start with that downgrade that we got on Apple because that's really what is moving the markets here in pre-market trading. Now the tech giant getting hit to Today with a rare downgrade, Barclays slashing its rating on the company to underweight, cutting its price target by about a dollar, now citing weaker demand for the very new iPhone 15. The analyst behind that call, Tim Long, writing, quote, our checks remain negative on volumes and mix for iPhone 15, and we see no features or upgrades that are likely to make the iPhone 16 more compelling. And Maddie, I actually just talked to Tim Long a few weeks ago, and I asked him about Apple, and he has long had a bearish view on Apple and a lot of the demand that we are seeing uh, from the iPhone, the fact that the demand just is, is not met expectations, being a huge headwind here for the tech giant. He doesn't think the iPhone 16 is going to be any different, too, just mm -hmm. in terms of some of that reception and lack of excitement that we're seeing right now with the iPhone 15. Well, it's great that we have that insight from you, from him, because I'm so curious about this, particularly given that it's just a $1 change. But if you look at the market, it seems like a much bigger reaction than that. Having said that, this has been the story for Apple over the past 12 months. None of this is necessarily that new. We've been talking about waning demand, uh, profits, revenues uh, going down. And so the question for a while has been, is the market going to start to have some questions about the valuations, about the multiple expansions for a name like Apple? Is this going to be the year that those valuations start to matter? Yeah, exactly. I mean, take a look at uh, Apple, obviously. Shares up just about 50% in 2023 alone. You mentioned valuation. So many of these headwinds that are facing not only Apple, but so many of these com consumer facing stocks when we take that all into account the fact that that stock is still up about 50 percent and has disregarded or really brushed aside any of those concerns is really one of the reasons that tim long is saying hey maybe it's time that we do see a bit more downward pressure on shares moving forward at least in the short term when we're starting uh, 2024 off with some concern already right all right well let's go to josh Schaefer standing by at the interactive on the treasury market and J uh, josh we're taking a look at uh, yields here pushing to the upside yeah, yields pressing up a little bit to start our first day of 2024 trading here. So you can see that's the 10-year yield up about 10 basis points. And then when you flick over to the 30-year yield up about 9 basis points. But I want to go back to the 10-year and just sort of talk about that number a little bit there. You're seeing 3.97% on your screen. One thing that I found interesting just thinking about where we're at with the 10-year treasury and rate strategists have been flagging this, we're already basically where a lot of rate strategists thought we would be to end 2024. And it is, of course, the first day of trading in 24. So when you take a look at the 10-year and the moves we saw over the last month, we really saw yields come down significantly. And we've seen that really throughout a lot of the year in the second half of the month. So remember, we had that big push up in October in the 10-year yield. Doesn't look like it's working for me right now, but I can pull up a little note from December that I found interesting. So this is your 10-year Treasury yield. It saw the biggest drop since 2008. So these big numbers here, that was 2008 where the 10-year Treasury yield dropped uh, the most there you can see. And then you can see really in 2023, we had that big drop 
in December. So that's something we're watching headed into the start of the year was in the same way that we saw stocks really shoot up in December. We saw yields fall. Remember, we've been following that for a while. Today, we're seeing yields up, stocks down. But just with how far yields fell in December, how much further do we really have to go to start the year, I think, is one of the big questions. And then, of course, in a week where we are going to talk a lot about economic data and talk a lot about jobs, we'll have to see how yields are reacting to that. Is bad news still good news? How do, how do yields move in reaction to that economic data is certainly going to be something we're watching this week. Josh, really quickly while we have you here, I mean, Treasury's seen record inflows, $177 billion in 2023. You mentioned some of the big questions here about whether or not that's going to be able to continue. But when you talk to your sources on the street, what are they telling you about what the bond market might be trying to tell us about where the macro environment is heading next year? Yeah, Maddie. I mean, when you think about something like Treasuries, right, you're obviously traditionally thinking about some level of a flight to safety, right? And I think when, when you, if you were to see yields really come down significantly, then the bond market might be telling us, okay, some of this data might be coming in too soft and we might be getting economic data that is a little bit concerning and you start wondering about a recession. One thing that I think has been interesting when you talk to different rate strategists is we talked a lot about volatility last year, right? You take a look at this one-year chart that we have up for the 10-year. And remember, when the 10-year ripped up in October, that was really one of the main things that people on the street were saying was holding back stocks. They, a lot of rate strategists do not see that volatility leaving in 24. They think that's gonna be another part of this market, at least at the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. So it will be something to watch in terms of just market volatility, yield expectations. There's certainly plenty of Fed uncertainty right now, which I'm sure you guys are gonna get into in the next hour on when that cut is coming and how many cuts we're gonna get. So still some uncertainty and probably volatility, but I guess that's kind of always the case, right, Manny? That's always the case. <laughs> and uh, a lot, at least last year, all that volatility left us right where we started when it comes to the bond market. Josh, thank you so much for joining us. We've also got Jared Blickbury in our newsroom here. Jared, I know you've got your eyes on oil prices this morning, seeing a lot of movement there. Talk to me about what we're seeing. That's right. We've seen a lot of price movement recently because of geopolitics, especially with what's happening in the Red Sea. And we can see this on the Wi-Fi Interactive. Crude futures overnight up about 1.59%. And there you go. That's crude oil seasonality. I'm going to talk about that in a second. I just wanted to kind of go over some of the fundamentals that are in play here. OPEC, OPEC Plus still running a tight supply market. And um, here, there you go. Let's check out a one-year chart because we just ended the year down about 5 or 6%. Not a big deal in in the long run and coming into the year there were high expectations for stocks and risk markets and crude oil itself because of the China reopening which did not occur as expected um, and then if you take a look at the five year you can see what a dull uh, uneventful year it actually was for crude oil because only the year before we had that uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine that's when prices spiked all the way up to 120 130 dollars per barrel uh, in various different grades there and nowhere near the drop that we saw in 2020. So all in all, an uneventful year. But if we can put that seasonality chart back up, one of the things that jumps off at me is that the oil prices go up. So uh, does this have to happen every year? No. But this is because of price inflation. Oil prices throughout the years have just averaged, uh, trended higher throughout the year. But you can see it really doesn't get going until about March. So we might have some sideways to down price action if we follow the play script. And it looks like there's another pause in May there before taking off in early July throughout the summer. So different different seasonality forces at work here. But I mentioned OPEC Plus. I believe they're cutting uh, 2.2 million barrels per day. Um, that's quite a high amount. And given where the price is right now, it's at the lower end of its price range, $65, well, $72.59. They could easily cut even more in the coming months. But that's not going to be, we're not going to learn anything about that for at least four weeks. So something to look out for on the horizon. The International Energy Agency, and the domestic Department of Energy, both expecting bigger demand this year. We know that didn't pan out last year, but that's what the expectation is this year. And um, as far as everything else goes, I think uh, oil is going to have going to have to be more reactive this year, and especially with respect to the Red Sea. I don't think we've seen any real scare yet. We got a little bit of a blip a few months ago with the Gaza incursion, but nothing uh, that really said fear. And that's what that's what you see in the markets when we get to $130 per barrel. 
All right, Jared, thank you so much for breaking all of that down for us as always. We really appreciate it. And now we're about 20 minutes away from the first opening bell of 2024. This year expected to be another uh, decade, it feels like, for markets. Stocks closing 2023 with a rally as the S&P 500 approaching record highs. Not making it there, though. Quite a few strategists expect the trend to continue, including our next guest. He's eyeing a 5,100 year-end target for the S&P. So joining us now, Drew Pettit, Citi's U.S. Equity Strategy director. Drew, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, I know that you've got that bullish call there, but obviously we're seeing in the market moves this morning that just one name can change a lot of what's going on when there's so much market concentration. So given that news from today on Apple, is this finally the year where valuations and company fundamentals start to matter to the degree that we can see that drive this entire market? So I'm going to flip this around a little bit. Yes, valuations elevated. We hear that a lot, and you guys have had me on before, and you, you've heard us. You've heard our spiel on this that you can probably hold valuations where they are today, maybe a touch lower. But really, again, let's flip it around. It's not about valuation anymore. It's about earnings and fundamentals. So if we feel like there's macro softness, if that feeds through to company softness, then you can have some weakness in the markets. But our base case is for earnings to grow almost 10%, and that's what's going to drive the market's gains this year in our view. So, Drew, that's a pretty optimistic outlook then if you are seeing earnings growth of about 10%. In terms of that leadership, where we are <laughs> going to see the most strength, what are you expecting on a sector basis? So it's funny. Tech is still going to contribute, and all the tech-related names, of course. Like they, These guys have massive sales growth. That should translate into free cash flow and earnings growth as well. But what's going to start to contribute is, well, everything else. We didn't see that last year. We saw the cyclicals in an earnings recession. We actually saw defensives in the worst earnings recession they've seen on record. So this year, we're going to, we want to see the cyclicals kick in. We want to see the defensives kick in next. So it's all about broadening to us. So we're not moving higher on a few names this year. We think it's got to be a broader rally beyond just the big seven. Well, I know when you mentioned kind of the sector movement here, you note that energy, materials, healthcare have total upward revisions below 50%. So I'm curious what your thinking is on those sectors moving into 2024 here. Is this a scenario where there's kind of nowhere to go but up for these names? A little bit. So look, you just had somebody on talking about energy and the price movements there. So a lot of people are resetting the price decks on WTI and crude in general. So expected to see that pullback and revisions on the energy side. On healthcare, you can have revisions come in a lot right now because the big biotech and pharma names are actually coming off a very, very low base for EPS. So while revisions are coming down, you're starting to see the earnings growth inflect off a very low base. To us, that should be more supportive of healthcare. And that's why we recently moved healthcare to a market weight in our sector calls. Drew, when it comes though to the Fed's timing of a rate cut and exactly what that looks like, I know you're putting more of an emphasis on the fundamentals and the earnings growth picture and your expectations there. How much though of that optimism about the Fed cutting has already been priced into the market? So look, our, our house base case is not for 150 uh, basis points of cuts for the Fed. That's what's priced into uh, Fed funds futures markets right now. You know, house economists are looking for about 75 to 100 basis points. If we get cutting of around, let's call it 50 to 100 basis points this year, because the Fed is normalizing to more stable inflation, that is a massive positive for the market. That's why we get this big push higher around soft landing being more priced in. So again, I don't think we need 150 basis points of cuts to sustain this market. If we get 150 basis points of Fed cuts this year and earnings fall apart, that might just put a higher floor under the market. It might not just push it higher. Drew, how many cuts are too much? At what point do you start to say the Fed's going to push us into a hard landing? Uh, honestly, I think the hard landing scenario is if they don't cut enough in response to economic weakness. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what's getting priced out of the markets. So we've talked a lot about what good news is being priced into markets, and that's what's pushing it higher. But we got to think markets price in scenarios to both sides. And what's happened a lot and, and really has been underappreciated and under discussed is we're pricing out that Fed is making a mistake and staying too restrictive for too long. 
So I think right. that's getting priced out and that's helping us. Well, Drew, I've got to ask you then, because given your kind of calculations here, those really happened before we saw the degree to which the situation in the Red Sea has escalated. Does that impact your view of what the disinflation narrative is going to look like this year if we start to see supply chain challenges that push up prices of goods? That is a risk, but as long as we have demand, we think we could you know, sustain demand at these levels. Even if demand is a touch softer, but still, I, I would say positive year over year, it, it's supportive of equity markets. And if you think of the direct impact of oil, honestly, I think the Fed's gonna look through that. Again, they like looking at trim mean PCE and a lot of core measures. So we still might be able to see some cuts even if oil moves higher from here. Yeah. All right, Drew Pettit, always great to get your insight. Thanks so much for joining us here. City's U.S. Equity Strategy Director. Thanks so much, Drew. Thank you. Well, Tesla is a top trending ticker on Yahoo Finance this morning. Shares moving to the upside in pre-market trading, up just about seven-tenths of a percent. The move higher coming after its fourth quarter delivery numbers topped expectations. Pras Subramanian joining us now at the table. Pras, there was lots of questions about whether or not Tesla was going to reach not only its fourth quarter goal, but its yearly goal. And it looks like this was enough to get it there. Yeah, you know, just just barely here. Just the numbers just crossing right now. Delivery wise, 484,000 for the quarter, beating estimates of 483,000 compiled by Bloomberg. Production wise, 494,000, almost 495,000 vehicles compared to 482, so a big beat there. They made a lot of Model 3s and Model Ys during the quarter, both, uh, they don't break out regionally, so you don't know where they're made, but definitely made more in China and the US and Fremont as well. Uh, for comment and, comment and comment and context here, you know, for the year, 1.81 million cars now for the year globally, that's 38% higher than a year, a year ago, so not a little bit below that 50% compound annual growth rate, which we knew that they were not gonna hit because of uh, factory shutdowns and tweakings and things like that. But you know, production slope 35% year over year to 1.85 million. That's some strong numbers there. No one is really making EVs like they are, except for BYD in China, which we <laughs> I know we're gonna talk about. But. Well, that's the exact question, right? To what extent does Tesla have to worry about some of those other names here? Yeah, so, so in, the, in this quarter, Q4, BYD made 526,000 pure EVs um, in the quarter, that's more than obviously more than what Tesla made for the year. Tesla is still higher, right? For the pure EV numbers, not just hybrid. So uh, still a ways to go, but it, they're catching them for sure. Uh, and we talk about BYD. Look, they're not just China. There's 70 countries in, around the globe, uh, uh, expanding in Europe a lot, Mexico too. So there's going to be a lot of pressure on Tesla to so to sort of how are they going to meet their growth rates if China is already kind of or BYD is sort of eating into their. Uh, competition. Yeah, and it just also shows how dominant China is in the EV market, how big of a player they are, obviously, not only in terms of some of the demand that they're seeing within China, but what that global growth picture looks like and how much pressure a lot of these companies could be under here. Right, exactly. I mean, the China story continues to be such an important narrative, particularly as that growth just hasn't uh, come back the way that a lot of the folks on the street that we talked to had anticipated. Uh, Praz, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Really appreciate it. Praz Submarine in there. Uh, we are also watching shares of ASML this morning. That's that's after President Biden had the company cancel some of its shipments to China. That's according to reporting from Bloomberg. This comes weeks ahead of the new Dutch restrictions set to take effect as well. So this is really about uh, the company moving a little bit more quickly than was necessary, given some of the requests from both um, the Biden administration, but also globally. And my big question is going to be, to what extent are we going to see some other European countries following suit here with more of these restrictions? And what is that going to be doing? to ASML. We had the CEO saying last year that you could see up to 15% of revenues for the name uh, getting impacted by some of these regulatory requests and changes. Uh, and it all just fo flows, Shauna, into the bigger question about the chips war in general, where China falls in that. Exactly. And also just how much pressure we could see on some of these bigger names here that do have exposure. Yes, just 15% of sales, which might not sound like a lot, but when you break it down just in terms of revenue impact, what it means for future growth prospects, that's really where we could see some material impact because we know ASML really relies on China for a bulk of its business, sure. making up about 50% of some of the business that we have seen here for the company comes out of China overall, accounting for almost half of ASML's sales. So yes, overall, these curbs in particular might just impact about 15% of the business here for ASML, but exactly like you were saying, just in terms of the worldwide 
worldwide impact if we could see other governments also crack down on China and some of their shipping exports, what exactly that means. But also just if we see this escalation of the trading war and the geopolitical tensions between the U.S. and China and some other governments, in this case, uh, the Dutch government there, just what that could mean for companies who are doing business today in China and the pressure they could have on sales as a result. Here. Exactly. I mean, President Biden can, can say all he wants to Xi Jinping, mm -hmm. hey, we're going to be fine. We're going to continue to work together. Yellen can do the same. But uh, when it comes down to it, we're going to see news like this continuing here. So coming up, major averages are looking like they're going to start the year in the red off of that Apple news. We got the first opening bell on Wall Street of 2024 on the other side of this break. We're here in Las Vegas, Nevada, outside of the Sphere. It's a massive music and entertainment venue that opened a few months ago. But the real reason we're in Sin City is for CES 2024. It's one of the largest tech shows on Earth. And we're going to be bringing you all of the news, innovations, and ideas hey, hey, out of... Hey, hold on. We're not in Vegas, man. We're still in New York. And that's not the Sphere. It's a cube. Oh, I'm going to miss my flight. Oh, taxi! Don't miss Yahoo Finance's coverage of CES 2024 in Las Vegas.
BTIG out with its top plays of 2024. The firm is saying that healthcare and biotech are its sectors to watch this year. Now, we want to dig in to these picks and more when it comes to some of these top picks. Maddie, we know investors are doing their best to position their portfolio for some of the gains that we could see here ahead over the next 12 months on this call out from BTIG. What caught my attention were those two particular things when it comes to healthcare and biotech. And here's why. We've talked so much this year about the tech sector, the Magnificent Seven, the lack of breath that we saw in the market when we see when we saw this massive run up, especially in the first half of the year. And then, of course, uh, to end the fourth quarter. But they're saying that, hey, even though healthcare underperformed back in 2022, didn't do a heck of a lot in 2023. They're making the case that healthcare is positioned for future gains heading into 2024, that we could see this breakout of the trading range that it has been stuck in. And then also biotech, the uh, BTIG saying that they do see biotech potentially emerging from this bear market that biotech has been in over the last three years. We have started to see more and more M&A activity pick up a bit there within the sector. Anjali Kamlani, our colleague there, make, uh, reporting a bunch on some of those recent deals like Bristol Myers Squibb. We have AstraZeneca. But then also just in terms of some of those individual names that they see, Legend Biotech Corp and Stoke Therapeutics, not necessarily stocks that are household names or are really known to uh, every investor out right. there. So they are seeing some of those stocks that are maybe underneath the hood or maybe some of those uh, lesser known plays as position at least they're making the case positioned well to really see a breakout this year yeah we had an analyst on the um, evening show on friday talking about how biotech is really positioned to have a great year heading into 2024 because of the amount of m a activity mm -hmm. that's expected just like you said uh, so it'll be interesting to continue to see whether or not that comes to fruition i remember reporting on the pfizer biogen deal uh, and the street didn't necessarily reward either of those names yeah following that because of questions about the numbers in terms of the final deal. So that's a question we're going to have mm -hmm. to contend with moving forward. But going back to this BTIG top picks list, I was interested in what they had to say about the tech names. We've been talking a lot about the concentration into the Magnificent Seven, of course. Um, some of these cybersecurity firms getting a lot of attention heading into this year. Um, I think about a service now, Palo Alto Networks, Okta, of course. And this is because given the AI boom, we're continuing to see concerns concerns for companies across the board about how they are going to deal with continued cybersecurity threats. And this is uh, something where AI is able to push forward on not only threats for these firms, but also it's a tool for these firms to use to be able to increase their offerings. We know that Microsoft, for example, offering um, some new products in terms of their cybersecurity uh, services that they're able to provide. And we're seeing the street rewarding that news every single time uh, in Palo Alto Network works, as you can see here, having a great year um, going up in the uh, pre-market trade a little bit as well here. So it's going to be interesting to see whether or not those cybersecurity firms can continue to cut costs using AI tools, Shauna. Um, yeah, exactly. And when it comes to some of those individual picks mentioning here, Okta, CrowdStrike, both have a buy rating on those. The fact that companies do need to spend on cybersecurity. Yes, they are cutting spending in many facets to try to better position their company in 2024. Certainly a lot of uncertainty out there in terms of the Fed cutting, what exactly that timing is going to look like. The fact that we are seeing a global economic slowdown has maybe made a companies rethink some of their spending plans as they look ahead to the new year. But when it comes to what we are seeing companies continue to spend on and not pull much, not pull back too much on, it is cybersecurity. That has been the theme there. And as we have seen from a number of analysts over the last several weeks, cybersecurity being some of those top plays for 2024. Yeah, and we also have news of some SEC regulations that are re going to require companies to disclose if they do have a cybersecurity breach. So you're going to want to make sure that you're protected there. But we got to get to our opening bell, Shauna. Let's get to the opening bell here on Wall Street as we kick off the first trading day of 2024. You can see some excitement down at the NASDAQ as well. As the New York Stock Exchange, we have the Customs and Border Protection. Uh, they're ringing the bell at the NICE and Weight Watchers over at the NASDAQ. When it comes to some of the broader market movement that we are seeing, taking a look at the three major averages and where they are starting in today's trading day, we are looking at some downward pressure across the board. You have the Dow off just about 160 points, the S&P off about six-tenths of a percent, the NASDAQ also off about almost 1% here, Maddie. So we are seeing a bit of a pause 
from that rally that we saw to end 2023. Yeah, it looks like we're not going to get that S&P 500 breakout record uh, that I was really hoping for on Friday, particularly because of the news with Apple. But first, I want to go global. We're seeing red on your screen uh, coming out of Asia this morning. That's due to a couple of things, um, some weaker than expected PMI data out of China, and also just that continued story about weaker than expected growth when it comes to the rebound coming out of the region following uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And that is what we saw in that PMI data this morning. The big question, whether or not we're going to see more stimulus out of China to combat some of that weakness that we're seeing in the market trade there. Also, you can see here in the U.S., obviously, a little bit of red on your screen. That's why we're not going to be hitting that S&P 500 peak uh, point target today. Uh, the uh, S&P 500 down about six tenths of a percent and the Nasdaq down eight tenths of a percent going into some of the individual movers here. It's going to be no surprise when Apple, there she is, really a, a lot of of red on your screen given the Apple news today that's dragging down a couple of the other names in the tech sector. We've got Microsoft, Google, Meta and Nvidia all in the red. Interesting given some of the Nvidia news today that was positive. Uh, but given given that Apple news, maybe it's a trade where you're seeing that Magnificent Seven and some of the ETFs tracking that Magnificent Seven dragging down all of those names given that news. So that's going to be interesting to watch as we head through the trading day today. Uh, is that Apple note from Barclays this morning, something that is digested and the street kind of moves on from it? Or is it something that continues to define our day here, Shauna? Yeah, certainly a lot of red on the screen and that bearish note there from Tim Long over at Barclays on Apple really uh, looks like at least driving the action here at the open with Apple shares off just about two and a half percent. All right, let's get over to Jared Blickery. We saw a lot of red on the screen that Maddie was standing by, but let's talk about some of the gains that we're seeing here today, Jared. And a lot of that Coming from Bitcoin above 45,000. That's right, Shauna, 46,000. Uh, let's go to the Wi-Fi Interactive because you're gonna see a notable difference uh, from the screen just as it was a few minutes ago. And there, there's all that green. And you put it over the last three days because we are in the midst of a multi-day rally. Uh, you can really see some of the outperformers here. Um, for what it's worth, uh, Hex up 84% over this time. Solana up 10.8%, even Shiba Inu up 10%. And you take a look at some of the crypto stocks here. Let me go to a market cap view. Um, so the bigger ones that have uh, Bitcoin exposure uh, pretty much down here. But here's Master Strategy. That's up about 4.2 percent. And we'll get a two day chart there. You can see quite a big pop on the open. I was looking at some of the pre-market movers here, and this is over the last three days. If you take a look at the la at only one day, a lot of these uh, losses that we were seeing over that period have been clawed back here. Let me just go back to Bitcoin and chart the price action over the last year, because this latest breakout is par for the course. We have seen just a series of higher lows and higher highs here. We've seen a number of consolidations, a lot of flags here, and they have all resolved to the upside. So this is the definition. This is a textbook uh, stair-stepping trend higher, not only over the short term, but over the long term, as this has been in place for several months now. Uh, I want to show you Bitcoin seasonality. I was able to generate this, and Bitcoin, this goes all the way back to uh, 2011, so it's basically the average of the returns every day of the year. And uh, when I say that, it's every day of the year it trades, so that makes it a little bit easier. But you can see it's really choppy here. Uh, we tend to uh, take a little bit of a tumble in May, June, early summer, then find our footing in July with another upswing in October. Uh, we'll have to see how it plays out this year, but seasonality works so well last year with stocks. Uh, worth paying attention to. All right, Jared, thank you so much. We really appreciate you giving us some of that market action on the opening here. An exciting day to watch. But we want to dig into one specific name with our trending ticker this morning. Southwest, Southwest Airlines getting hit with a downgrade from Evercore ISI this morning. That was from outperform to just in line. Never a sell rating from these analysts. Uh, the analysts behind the call saying the recent rally for the stock may have come too early, with the company still mid-transition. And this is a company that's also facing uh, uh, a record-breaking fine from the federal government given some of the challenges that they had last year, Shauna, over the holidays. So I think it's to the tune of $140 million, that fine. So that's obviously going to be um, something that the street is not going to be happy about when it comes to this name. Yeah, and also just lots of questions about what exactly the demand picture is going to look like given the fact that a lot of these airlines do have a number of headwinds facing them as we enter 2024. We were just talking about the rise in oil prices that we have seen now back above 80 bucks a barrel, exactly 
what that pressure is going to do or the costs that some of these airlines are going to incur if we do see a further escalation within the Red Sea and obviously what that could then mean uh, for crude prices, for jet fuel prices down the line. But we are seeing some declines here across the board. It is not just Southwest that's under some pressure here this morning on this call from Evercore, but you've also got names like American Air, Delta moving to the downside, JetBlue, the worst performer here, at least of this morning. We don't want to dig too much into that, at least just yet, but JetBlue shares off nearly 3%. Now, going back to Southwest in this call here from Evercore, the analysts there making the case, at least, that the current growth rate feels a little bit out of sync with the current pace of the U.S. economic growth. And given the fact that we do see some of those headwinds remaining here, they also point out that we could see uh, some turbulence I didn't even mean, really mean to do that. Huh? That's Actually, amazing, that's Shana. Really, going into, that's a professional wow, anchor. Wow, just like the new year. Okay. <laughs> but they're saying that we're below the street for 24 and see our margin outlook as below the long run potential. So given all that, and given the rise that we have seen off the lows back in November, they are saying that we could see a bit of a pullback here, at least ahead. So we'll see whether or not that comes to fruition and what that could mean for some of those other airline names. All right, let's take a look at shares of Boeing, because that is also a trending ticker here at Yahoo Finance this morning. Shares off just about 1%. Goldman Sachs removing the stock from its U.S. conviction list. Now, the move following Boeing's warning last week that some of its 737 MAX planes might have a loose bolt. For more on this, we want to bring in Brian Langham. He's a Langenberg and company's principal here to break this all down. And let's talk about the move that we have seen in Boeing. Yes, we are seeing shares under a bit of pressure here this morning, but taking a look at some of those longer term movements that we have seen in the stock, we have seen a bit of a bounce back off of those 52 week lows. How do you see Boeing set up here for 2024? Well, uh, you know, a lot of the juice has been squeezed out in the near term. The stock, uh, it's kind of seesawed here. I mean, we were at 235, 240, yeah, going into the fall of last year. Turns out Boeing had another oops in one year of, oh, we might have a structural thing from one of our suppliers. Drove the stock from 240 down to 180. Here we are back up at 260. So in terms of the shares here, is there upside? Yes. Um, you know, clearly, we're still in the midst of a commercial aerospace recovery. But you do have to think about the clouds on the horizon, the macro. Um, U.S. is slowing. China is slowing. Western Europe is sucking wind. I've just described 60 percent of global GDP. Hmm. So the headwinds are there. There's some upside yet, but it's not the home run it was, uh, you know, when I printed it three months ago. Well, it's not the home run anymore, but it's certainly not getting a lot of dings from the street. We've got 80% of analysts having a buy rating here and 18% having a hold on Boeing. So what is the biggest silver lining for this name that analysts are really pointing to here? Well, my, my, I'll speak for myself. My position on the stock the last two to three years has been, you know, and COVID's in the past, okay, um, but, you know, sales had bottomed for commercial aircraft to like 20 billion and over time you knew that was going to come back to 60 billion that can't not work they're making i mean the revenue progress is coming back so the problem is making money um and they have really struggled the last couple of years i mean when i compare um and, and never not no two things are exactly the same but when i compare say a two-year period like around 09 2010 you know, they had to combine those two years, maybe about 130 billion of revenue, and they made like you know, six, seven, eight dollars cumulatively. Last two years, the same revenue base, they've reported 17 billion dollars of losses. Um, so there's still work to do execution-wise. Um, you know, the silver lining is that expectations of the company are very low. Right. When it comes to some of the supply chain, the fact that we have seen a bit of a change uh, in their supply chain, in terms of the risk that that could pose or how that positions Boeing against some of the rivals, how does Boeing stack up? So a couple of things on the supply chain side, you know, there were a couple specific things, both relating to, you know, the fuselage, you know, which they purchased their fuselages from Sprint, which had been their own operations till about 20 some years ago okay um and 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 um i'm sorry i said sprint i meant spirit air um my my, my apologies on that um and you know the industry have been comparing complaining about labor shortages but i would submit that labor can be found if you treat it right in terms of how they're positioned versus competitors 
They only have one. It's Airbus. Okay? So the world wants two large commercial aircraft manufacturers, and besides China, of course, and, um, and the other one's Airbus. So no matter what, they're going to have their 40% market share on the downside. Airbus, of course, is doing much better than they are. They're coming in with higher deliveries, higher profitability. And I don't think anything changes that for the foreseeable future between the two. Boeing will get its share, um, mm. but their, their, their focus is it needs to be to actually drive profitability, and that's where they are lagging. Well, Brian, I want to talk a little bit about the geopolitical landscape here because there are obviously plenty of wars to go around. But if defense spending and budgets for defense, defense spending uh, don't increase, that's not necessarily going to matter. So to what extent does <laughs> defense spending and budgets for that spending impact a, a name like Boeing? Sure. Well, uh, you know, I don't know, depending upon where you are in the cycle, you know, 40, 45 percent of the company is defense. And the thing about defense spending is, although some of the money is wasted, um, when war is becoming more popular, people buy more stuff to kill people and break things. So, yes, of course, they should benefit. Um, now, Boeing's portfolio isn't exactly cutting edge, but they do make stuff that people need. So they should benefit incrementally. They are, unfortunately, working through some mispriced um, business from the past. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Brian. We really appreciate it. Brian Langenberg uh, from Langenberg and Company Principal. Really appreciate your time. We got to talk about some news coming out from Rivian out with delivery numbers this morning. The EV maker delivered nearly 14,000 vehicles in the fourth quarter. That was 10 percent below the previous three months. And you're seeing the street reacting negatively to that news this morning, down uh, 8.6 percent. And this is also because uh, Tesla having the Opposite uh, news today, Shauna, having good news on their deliveries. So, uh, again, just seeing that missed expectations from their EV deliveries uh, for the fourth quarter, uh, delivering kind of a sequential decline from the prior previous, previous period, rather, uh, really having an impact on the trade today for Rivian. It is having an impact. You're looking at losses of just about 8%. Now, this is a stock that had risen nearly 30% in 2023. So, we are seeing Rivian give back some of those gains, but they are dealing with problems that are outside of their control to some extent. We've mm -hmm. talked about the fact that EV demand is slowing a bit, or I shouldn't say slowing, not meeting the expectations that many of the auto giants had expected to see, at least here in the U.S. So that is a headwind for Rivian, a headwind for their competitors here going forward. Deliveries, though, that's the big reason why we are seeing the stock under so much pressure this morning. They delivered about 13,000, just over 13,900, which was short of what the street was looking for. And that is really the focal point for investors right now. They're looking past some of those production gains that we saw this past quarter, and they're focusing in on delivery numbers and exactly what that tells us about what the demand could look like here for Rivian in 2024. Now, it's important to point out that Rivian right now makes two EVs the pickup, and they also have a uh, SUV that they are now uh, selling on the market, the, the battery uh, EV van for Amazon as well, which is its single biggest shareholder. But there has been lots of questions about Rivian being able to execute and being able to produce the number of vehicles that are necessary, being able to scale its production in terms of meeting some of their forecasts there. That has been a question from, from many analysts on the street. And these delivery numbers, at least, the fact that we did see them fall just a bit short, raising some of those demand, more broadly speaking, on the EV market overall and exactly what that could look like, not only for Rivian, but maybe some of the competitors out there as well. Right. Tesla, BYD, mm -hmm. we've got all these other names too flooding the space a little yeah. bit, Shauna. Uh, coming up here, oil prices are rising to start off the year, but investors should expect volatility to continue in 2024. We've got the outlook for oil on the other side here. We're here in Las Vegas, Nevada, outside of the Skier. It's the massive music and entertainment venue that opened a few months ago. But the real reason we're in Sin City is for CES 2024. It's one of the largest tech shows on earth. And we're going to be bringing you all of the news, innovations, and ideas hey, hey, out of. Hey, hey, hold on. We're not in Vegas, man. We're still in New York. And that's not the Sphere, it's a cube. Oh, I'm going to miss my flight. Oh, taxi!
Don't miss Yahoo Finance's coverage of CES 2024 in Las Vegas. Let's take a look at oil here. Oil prices on the move with crude just around 71 bucks a barrel. Now this move here in crude and why we're taking a look at Brent as well comes as tensions escalate in the Middle East. Iran sending a warship into the Red Sea after the U.S. destroyed three Houthi rebel ships, killing 10 militants over the weekend. This is all according to multiple reports. So as the situation continues to escalate, can we expect more volatility for oil? We want to bring in Andy Lipow. He's the president of Lipow Oil Associates. Andy, it's great to have you here. So we are seeing crude. We did see it move uh, higher in earlier trading now, just around 71 bucks a barrel. But as we do see tensions escalate here in the Red Sea, how do you see that impacting oil, at least in the short term? Well, good morning, and thank you for having me. In the near term, the bias for oil prices is going to be on the upside. I should point out that since Hamas invaded Israel, we have yet to see any oil supply disruption. But as tension rises, the market is increasing the probability that a mistake might be made that results in a supply disruption, whether it's through the Red Sea transit lanes or through the Strait of Hormuz. 
Well, I'm curious then, Andy, which geopolitical tension is the most concerning for President Biden right now when it comes specifically to the impact it has on the price of oil? Is it what we're seeing in the Red Sea? Is it the climate change impact that we're seeing uh, in the Panama Canal? Which one has the biggest potential to keep President Biden up at night, given the impact it could have on the price of oil? Well, President Biden is in a dilemma because on the one hand, the administration is focused on gasoline prices. And on the other hand, he wants to keep oil supplies flowing in order to tamp down the price of crude oil, which means that geopolitically, this is all wrapped up actually between the Middle East, Iran, Venezuela, and Russia. And he's got to be playing all of those um, issues at the same time. Of course, Iran is backing Hamas, Hezbollah, and the Houthi rebels. And we, of course, have Iran aligned with Russia. So you can see how all of these issues are inextricably linked together, causing the Biden you know, uh, administration a number of sleepless nights. So Andy, you said the bias here is to the upside. We're at 71 bucks a barrel, just above 71 bucks a barrel today. How much higher are we headed? Well, I think a year from now, we're going to be looking at 85 to $87 a barrel. But in between now and then, we could see oil prices fall to below $67 a barrel based on Chinese demand. And on the other hand, we could see them reach 93 to $95 a barrel if there were to be a supply disruption in the Middle East. And talk to me about that a little bit more, Andy, that supply disruption in the Middle East. Talk me through what you know to be the thinking behind some of that disruption and what some of those decisions look like so that we can kind of anticipate what's to come from that. Well, certainly the drone attacks in the Red Sea have caused many companies to reroute their tankers around the Cape of Good Hope. And of course, that increases the cost from shipping uh, standpoint, as well as increases the the uh, cost of the oil that's going to be delivered to uh, various locations around the world. Through the Red Sea, we've got oil from the Persian Gulf moving into Europe. At the same time, Russian and North African oil is moving in the opposite direction through the Red Sea into markets in Asia and India. So that is one thing that we're looking at. Of course, 20 percent of the uh, of the world's uh, oil supplies are moving through the Strait of Hormuz. So if we should see tensions escalate, especially between Iran and the U.S. or Iran and Saudi Arabia, there could be a supply disruption in that part of the world. So, and I think a lot of viewers at home are asking themselves what this means for gas prices. We know that that has been the focal point here for many viewers. Right now, we're right around 310 a, or 310 a gallon, excuse me, nationwide average, according to AAA. Are we headed back then towards at least 350? Well, I think the national average across this year is going to be below $3.50 a gallon, which will be good news for consumers because that will be less than we saw last year in 2023. But I do think as we get to the end of the summer, we could see the national average peak at about $3.75 a gallon. I am certainly not projecting the national retail average to go above $4 a gallon or even $5 a gallon. And one of the big beneficiaries uh, for, uh, for the oil market has been the increase in oil production here in the United States which is up about 10% compared to December of 2022 at an all-time record of 13.3 million barrels a day, which of course is helping to mitigate any oil price increases. All right, Andy, we really appreciate you joining us to break down all of the big movements in the oil market. Andy LaPau joining us uh, from LaPau Oil Associates. He's the president over there. Andy, thank you so much. Now, coming Thanks up, for having me. Wall Street getting more and more bullish on NVIDIA uh, with another firm adding the company to their best ideas list for 2024. We'll bring you their analysis coming up next. If you can talk about one big theme, for 2023, it has to be AI. The AI hype cycle has swept the nation this year. AI is still drawing a lot of attention. The AI boom. AI boom. Increasingly powerful AI models. AI. 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 Don't miss Yahoo Finance's coverage of CES 2024 in Las Vegas. We'll bring you the latest news, innovations, and big ideas in artificial intelligence.
NVIDIA is the best idea for the new year. That's at least according to a new note from Stiefel, the firm maintaining its buy rating and price target on the chip company, saying that NVIDIA can build on the AI momentum that it started back in 2023. And it's really no surprise as it joins a lot of other firms on the street who are bullish on this name. We've got Bernstein uh, and Cohen who maintain their outperform ratings in we recent weeks as well. Uh, the company's seen a consensus rating of 92.2% with zero cells and 7.8 holds, according to Bloomberg data on this name. Having said that, they're obviously in the red this morning on some of the news that we were talking about, Shauna, with those EV deliveries. But still, uh, when you dig through this note from Stiefel, seeing a lot of positivity due to um, their GPUs and their chips as well. They've got this uh, Grace Hopper super chip that's getting a lot of positive attention, and they talk about Dell's interest in that product. So seeing a lot of positivity for some of their other offerings in the mix. A lot of positivity, and this is just incredible because to put this in perspective, this is a stock that soared about 240% in 2023. And this call out here this morning from Stiefel, they're making the case that it's going to rally more than 30% over the next 12 months on top of the gains that we have seen over the last 12 months, naming it its best idea. Now, in terms of where they see the catalyst coming from, or the driver, I should say, Stiefel making the argument that the overall TAM, total addressable market, TAM, the street loves that there, mm. more than 100 billion exiting 2025, a longer term opportunity funnel that could approach a trillion dollars. Now, in terms of some of the risks, it is important to point out that they do name about three risks here. The one that stuck out to me was any unforeseen impacts on increasing trade restrictions on technology shipped to China. And I bring that up with the news that we were talking about earlier uh, this morning with ASML there in terms of curbing some of their exports to China, the impact that that is having on that stock, some of the concerns that that then raises about the rest of the chip sector. But NVIDIA, at least we know, has been up until this point able to navigate around some of those headwinds very well, at least come any analyst or investor concerns up until this point. And this is just another analyst coming out with a very bullish view on NVIDIA heading into the rest of 2024. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how much higher this name can go, given the performance that you already mentioned uh, that we've seen with NVIDIA over the course of 2023 and whether or not some of the names associated with them are going to continue to soar as well, but really getting rewarded because of their three-pronged technology approach that they note in this uh, note as well. Hardware, software, and networking coming from NVIDIA. So potentially you could see today as a day to get in on a little bit of a sale for you, this name. You could. We'll see whether or not they're right here with their 12 months a target of a rally of nearly 34% from uh, Friday's close. All right, well, coming up next, a new year, new Wall Street calls, analysts naming their biggest winners and best ideas for 2024 within the tech sector. We'll bring you the biggest winners on the other side. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Shauna Smith alongside Madison Mills. We're just about 30 minutes into the trading day. Let's take a look at how things are shaping up. Now, it is the first trading day of the year and stocks starting the year on a downbeat note. We are seeing this move here to the downside as investors await the jobs report on Friday, which will be the first piece of key economic data here of the year. And we're taking a look at Wall Street's top picks in tech, starting with Uber. Wells Fargo choosing the ride hailing giant as its top pick in 2024. As the analysts saying it sees room for EBITDA rationalization in the new year. And Microsoft named one of the biggest ideas for 2024 by Loop Capital. Now, coming off a very hot year in 2023, the stock soaring over 50%, thanks a lot to the hype surrounding artificial intelligence and open AI. Now, this analyst expecting AI to continue to be a tailwind for Microsoft, as well as growth here in its cloud unit. And sticking with tech, Amazon was just added to RBC Capital Market's top global ideas for 2024, joining other tech giant Meta on the list of 30 global market leaders. The two, of course, rallied along with the other Magnificent Seven members in 2023 and topped several top pick lists. And it's the first workday of the year for most people in the U.S., but Congress still on vacation until the 8th. Must be nice. Lawmakers facing yet another government shutdown coming up on the 19th. Under the two-tiered stopgap bill passed in November, Congress has 11 days until funding lapses for various parts of the government. Now, election years, they're usually a boon for stocks, but could contention on the Hill throw a wrench in strategists' expectations? So for more on this, we're going to bring in Isaac Boltansky, BTIG director. Director of Policy Research. And Isaac, thanks so much for being here with us. We've got those two days coming up that are going to uh, lead to those big questions about what's going on with funding down in Washington. Talk to me about just how big a risk those days hold in terms of the potential impact to markets. Is there um, a huge read through there in terms of the effect that we could expect to see? You know, look, the top line answer here is I'm telling clients to try to push the noise from D.C. out of their investing thought process, at least for the next few months. These government shutdown uh, risks are real. And look, I still think that we are going to have a government shutdown in the first quarter because we have yet to see any meaningful progress on the basic foundations of deal. Keep this in mind. We still don't have agreement on the top line funding numbers. That should be one of the first big steps to getting a deal. Then you fight over all the particulars in there. So we are still miles away from a deal, and I think we're going to get a shutdown. But it should not matter to investors because there will be a deal eventually that funds the government through the end of the fiscal year. Any of the missed economic activity during that period will be made up, everything from uh, salaries to uh, government approvals for projects. And the only thing that when I think about a, a government shutdown that worries me is that if it is prolonged, it could have an impact on uh, official data coming from government agencies. And obviously that feeds into the Fed's uh, interest rate thinking. So that's the only caveat that I have. Otherwise, we should completely dismiss the headlines and the risks around a government shutdown from an investment perspective. So Isaac, then should investors at least be looking at if we do see a government shutdown, we do see the markets react negatively to that, should they be viewing it then as a buying opportunity? Yeah, look, I, I think that I think that any over any any negative reaction from a government shutdown uh, will be short lived. And so I think I think your framing is fair. And my only caveat, again, is the only thing that really matters in D.C. right now is what the Fed's going to do. And so I do worry about that official data. And if we have a two or four week shutdown, then I'm going to start to worry because maybe that alters some of the trajectory thoughts from the market in terms of rate cuts um, or, or the rate trajectory overall. But otherwise, you should completely dismiss this and instead start to worry and think about the 2024 election. Isaac, in terms of the biggest disagreements and the lack of progress that we have seen uh, be made here within Congress, when it comes to some of those top line spending numbers, where do those biggest disagreements lie at this point? Sure. The way to think about this, at least right now, is there's there's broad agreement in the Senate. Senate Democrats and Senate uh, Republicans, especially the appropriators, have general agreement around the top line spending level and over um, specific um, appropriations dynamics. It's the other side of that is the House. You have the House Republicans who continue to want a lower spending level, 
Um, in fact, over the past few weeks uh, during the break, you saw them come out and introduce new demands, things like rescinding uh, some unspent COVID funds, accelerating IRS cuts. But what really complicates this is everything else. And right, we're facing crises at home and abroad. And when I think about um, home and abroad, it's things like border security funding, which is taking up a fair amount of air here in town, rightfully so, as well as funding for Ukraine and Israel. And so those are the real complicating factors here because, you know, Congress is trying to build its own Christmas tree and put all of the ornaments on it at once. And it gets difficult when you when you're talking about such divergent and disparate um, issues. Well, as Congress is building that Christmas tree, Isaac, we've also got uh, this little thing called a presidential election this year. Uh, and a lot of elections around the globe, I think about 50 percent of global leaders are running for re-election to whatever uh, degree it's described in their nations this coming year. But I'm curious about what the market impact could look like. We know that uh, when a sitting president is running for re-election, that's usually very good for markets, but we don't have a lot of historical data about when that sitting president is running against a former president as well. Yeah, look, I think I think that we can look to Congress to do some things that are positive from an economic standpoint before they go home to run for re-election, right? I have some degree of optimism about a, a narrow tax deal that will address some of the business taxes that have expired, EBITDA, research and, and development, as well as the child tax credit. I think that's the type of thing that we get used to. Lawmakers like to bring some money home before they run for re-election. The presidential election is going to be long and emotionally draining and complicated and difficult to get your arms around. Let's keep in mind, if it is Biden v. Trump again, which I think it will be at this moment. That last election was decided by 44,000 voters in three states. And so it's going to be incredibly difficult to have true conviction one way or the other around this, especially given the complication of third party candidates. But there are acute themes that I think are worthy of investors looking at as they prepare to get their to prepare to wrap their arms around the election. There are differences between these two, and there are also some difference between the politics and and the 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 promises that we see on the campaign trail. For example, the IRA and its green energy tax credits. They're not getting reversed. Doesn't matter what you hear from the campaign trail. That's not happening. The ACA, the Affordable Care Act, not getting reversed. Doesn't matter what you hear from the campaign trail. So I've been trying to focus on those types of, of acute issues rather than calling the big election, which is still months away. Isaac, can you talk to us about some of the other themes that you're also watching that you think investors should keep in mind, given the fact that if we do see a Republican or Democrat in the White House, just what in terms, I guess, how they should be positioning their portfolio or their investment, how they should be looking at investment opportunities then beyond the 2024 election? Sure. Look, I think they're, the way that we did this in our year ahead note, it was to try to look at who the winners and losers might be with a Republican in the White House. And a few areas that have gotten a fair amount of interest are um, the largest banks. As you know, there have been proposals under the Biden administration to increase the capital requirements for the nation's biggest banks and some super regional banks by 15 to 20 percent. You could see those being reversed or materially softened with a Republican in the White House. The mortgage giants, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, who have been in conservatorship for over 15 years, you could see those finally see some some movement towards exiting conservatorship. I think that you would also have um, uh, private prisons, which are an area that also has a nexus with the uh, with the border surge and border security debate here in town. I think they would also um, have a tailwind in a Republican administration. So those are the types of themes that clients have been focused on over the past few weeks. And I'm sure we'll have more because a lot of it depends what we hear from the campaign trail, which is just heating up. It is just heating up, and we'll be talking to you a heck of a lot more here over the next several months. Isaac Boltanski, always great to get your insight here. BTID Director of Policy Research. Thanks so much. Well, Wall Street ending 2023 optimistic that the Fed is going to cut rates in the new year. Today, though, we are seeing some traders pull back on those bullish bets. 69% of traders pricing in the first rate cut to happen in March. Now, that number is down about 4% from the levels that we saw yesterday. We will get more investor reaction this week when the minutes from the Fed's last meeting in December are released tomorrow. And a number of FOMC officials are going to be speaking throughout the week. Yahoo Finance's Jennifer Schomberger has the details on that. Hi, Jen. 
Hey, Shauna. Happy New Year to you. Good morning. Uh, this week, a bit light on Fed speak, but we perhaps will get more clarity on the Fed's thinking around rate cuts when minutes from the December policy meeting are released on Wednesday. Think back to last year when Fed Chair Jay Powell did a surprisingly dovish pivot following a cacophony of differing viewpoints from inside the Fed. New York Fed President John Williams is seemingly walking things back, saying that the Fed was not even talking about rate cuts, whereas Chair Powell said during his press conference that rate cuts would be a topic of discussion looking ahead. Uh, other officials, of course, the median penciling in three rate cuts for this year. Meanwhile, Chicago Fed President Austin Goolsbee saying the Fed not pre-committing to cutting interest rates soon or swiftly, while Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin told me in an interview he needs to see more conviction, more consistency that inflation is coming back to the Fed's 2% target before he considers cutting rates. These minutes, of course, coming down tomorrow. Also tomorrow, we will hear from Richmond's Barkin with a fresh outlook on the economy. We will also get key jobs data on Friday when the jobs report is released, which officials will use for their next policy decision expected at the end of this month. Guys. Yeah. Jennifer, it's all about that data, it seems. Thank you so much, Jennifer Schomberger, for joining us. And Happy New Year to you. We've got all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned right here. You're watching Yahoo Finance. If you can talk about one big theme for 2023, it has to be AI. The AI hype cycle has swept the nation this year. AI is still drawing a lot of attention. The AI boom. AI boom. Increasingly powerful AI models. AI. 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 Don't miss Yahoo Finance's coverage of CES 2024 in Las Vegas. We'll bring you the latest news, innovations, and big ideas in artificial intelligence.
Well, emerging markets are taking a hit to kick off 2024 as economic concerns led China stocks to have the worst opening to their year since 2019. Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery is standing by with the details. Jared, what's going on? Maddie, inauspicious start to the year. You can see I have two ETFs here. One is the iShares EM ETF. That's down almost 1%. And then I have it without China. And that's down a little bit less, about eight-tenths of a percent. One day does not a trend make, but this has been the trend over the last year, which is ex-China, the emerging market sphere, has uh, been outperforming that with China. And if you're wondering here, well, and saying China is probably one of the biggest uh, countries in the world. In fact, it's the second business, biggest, first biggest by certain metrics. So should it be classified as an emerging market? 20 years ago, it was a definite yes, but today, uh, kind of in the air. But nevertheless, that's what we're working with. Uh, so in purple here, we have the Emerging Markets ETF, and that it contains China. And you can really see the divergence. It started here around the internet bank panic around March, and that was also the time when it was becoming very apparent that China was not going to have the reopening that everybody was hoping for. And you can see over the last five years, uh, some of the peaks and the valleys uh, have been a little bit different here, but ex-China has definitely outperformed uh, up 19% versus 1.69%. And let me just show you the global stock market indices so you can see how the entire world fits into this. Uh, at the very top here, this is over the last year, this is the NASDAQ up 41%, then the uh, Nikkei that's up 28%, Brazil's Bovespa that's up 25%, and then in the US we have the S&P 500, 23%. Now the emerging markets ex-China is 15.8%, so that's kind of in the middle, and then emerging markets with China, that's 5.1%, and you take a look at China by itself, uh, the Hang, excuse me, the Hang Seng down 15.1% right here, and the Shanghai Composite down 4%. Uh, there is a lot of different dynamics at play. But for China stocks to bounce back this year, going to require more targeted stimulus. And the problem with all that stimulus is it encourages capital flight out of the country. Uh, that has to do with uh, the UN. People don't want to hold something uh, if it's a devaluing asset. So these currency maps, this is the US dollar versus uh, a bunch of other currencies out in the world. And US dollars gained 358% versus the Argentine peso. That's an extreme example, hyperinflation, or at least on the verge of that over there. And then at the opposite end, the US dollar has lost about 12.5% to the Mexican peso. And then you take a look at Brazil, it was down 7.4, the US dollar was down 7.4%. These are economies that are actually run, running somewhat tight monetary policies relative to, to their economies. And here's China. This is a pretty low figure. The U.S. dollar only gained 3.5%. That means the Chinese uh, yuan only lost 3.5% over the last year. Uh, but this right here, 15-year high. So if we kept, keep going higher there, if the yuan keeps weakening, that's going to pose some structural problems for the Chinese government. And could be more pressure here for uh, broader emerging markets as well. Jared Blickery, always great stuff. Thanks so much. Well, tensions in the Red Sea are escalating as Iran sends a warship into the vital shipping route after major companies were forced to redirect their shipping courses. Now the diversion sent ocean freight prices soaring. So how are companies navigating this challenge? We want to bring us Atish Jindal. He's a ship matrix president. Shatish, it's great to have you here. So we, we've been talking about fears of trade disruption. I understand that you help retailers, distributors, also manufacturers of all sizes. So what have the conversations been like with your clients in terms of how you are evaluating this type of risk? You know, there are certain products that have a kind of a value where they can justify it being converted to an air freight, but by and large, more than 80, 90% of what's moving in the ocean liner has to move as an ocean liner because of a huge difference in the cost between ocean and air. So they are having to consider routing it around the African continent, which adds to the cost and to the extra time, but that is still better than trying to put it on the aircrafts. Talk to me about what that does to prices as they reach consumers in the end here. Can you talk to me about what some specific numbers might look like for that? You know, air freight is generally about eight to 10 times more than the ocean freight. So think of what that will do to add to the shipping cost. And while the shipping costs today are lower for a container, 
It could be about $2,000. Uh, they were during the pandemic time up to 15, 20,000. And you can see how the cost of goods were increasing during that time. So it is not good for the consumers to have to deal with a change and increase in the shipping cost that would come as a result of this diversion. Yes, yeah, Satish, talk a little bit more about that, just how much of an increase consumers could see and as a result in some of their goods if we do see shipping costs or reduce the airfare costs rise as a result of some of this disruption. You know, when you think of transportation represents anywhere from five to seven percent of the cost of what people are, are buying of the whole cost of the good. Uh, and if that goes up, uh, you can the consumers can see a mid single digit five to seven percent increase in the cost of the final product that they would be buying as a result of the diversion. I'm still stuck on what you said, that there could be an eight to 10 times increase in the price when you switch over um, to air from ground. That is a huge potential impact that could really disrupt the disinflationary narrative that we've been hearing heading into this year. What's the timeline look like when you see a disruption like this? When does that start to hit consumers at the end here? You know, it will vary by the product and how long the shelf life is for the product and how fast the consumers want certain items. There are some products that are stocked in the country that are being replenished by what's coming. And if that's the case, they will continue to ship it from the warehouses they already have the product in. But as it continues, and if this goes on for a month, two months, then the consumers will see, feel it even more than in the next week or two weeks. Satish, we initially reached out to you because of a journal article that you were quoted in. It was talking about how China-backed retailers are shipping millions of U.S. packages a day. Talk to us just about the supply chain landscape up until this point. We had spent so much about the pandemic talking about the fact that more and more is being manufactured here in the U.S. But how much do we still rely on China and are very much reliant on supply coming out of there in terms of the fact that we are extremely far from this decoupling narrative that has certainly had taken hold over the last year or two. You know, the story of Timu and Shane is a very impressive one. What's important here is to realize that the internet has finally come to full scale in enabling the consumer to be able to buy the products almost directly from the manufacturer. And what Timu and Shane are doing is they are getting the orders from the consumer and then obtaining the products from the small manufacturers in China, doing the packaging, doing the validation of the quality and everything in real time, eliminating the need for a lot of warehouses and stocking it, which adds to the inventory cost and shipping the item individually packaged with the address label of the consumer directly from China using the lower labor cost that they have compared to what we have in the U.S. And I may add that you may have heard this week or yesterday how many states have increased the minimum wages. Well, guess what? That just makes it more attractive for every task that can be done in China instead of bringing it here and then having an American worker spend the time undertaking those activities. Right. All uh, interesting things to consider when we think about that inflationary narrative heading through this year. Satish, thank you so much for joining us. That was Satish Jinjal. He is Ship Matrix president. Now, coming up, we're going to have all your markets action ahead. So stay tuned right here. You're watching Yahoo Finance. We're here in Las Vegas, Nevada, outside of the Skier. It's the massive music and entertainment venue that opened a few months ago. But the real reason we're in Sin City is for CES 2024. It's one of the largest tech shows on earth. And we're going to be bringing you all of the news, innovations, and ideas hey, hey, out of. Hey, Howie, hold on. We're not in Vegas, man. <laughs> we're still in New York. And that's not the Sphere, it's a cube. Oh, I'm going to miss my flight. Oh, taxi! Don't miss Yahoo Finance's coverage of CES 2024 in Las Vegas.
Some CEOs starting new jobs today. The big question, will 2024 be the year of C-suite shakeups? Prominent companies like Morgan Stanley, Krispy Kreme, and Sherwin-Williams starting this year with brand new CEOs. Plenty more are expected to add new names to executive positions throughout the year. So how will all of this turnover impact business models as we start off this year? Here to answer that question, we've got Andy Challenger, Senior Vice President and Head of Sales and Media at Challenger Gray and Chris. Christmas. Andy, thanks so much for coming on with us to talk about this. We're going to talk a lot about the overall jobs market, but I got to start on this CEO shakeup. I mean, what's going on with all the CEOs? Why are we seeing so much turnover in this position? Sure. Yeah, it is a, kind of an underreported story. We're seeing the highest level of CEO turnover uh, over the course of 2023 as compared to any year that we tracked over the prior 20. It was a big spike. It was higher than 2019 when people were heralding it as an exodus of CEOs. Uh, but what I think we're seeing is a couple of factors pent up demand for turnover. There were a lot of CEOs that were asked to stay on through the COVID crisis, not to leave their companies in the middle of a lot of turmoil. And now they're feeling more comfortable and able to leave. And also companies feeling more certainty about what the post COVID world is gonna look like and bringing in new leaders to adjust to strategies that are based in this new world. Andy, what are you seeing sector wise? And when it comes to what this all means then for 2024, this trend that we saw play out in 2023, is that something that you see sticking here then in the new year? Yeah, I think we're going to continue to see an elevated rate of turnover, both at the C-suite level and in the rest of the labor market. We really saw a concentrated in a handful of industries that saw the biggest spikes in growth uh, during the COVID years, but maybe some coming back down to the earth in, in 2023. So finance, healthcare, technology, a few areas where there was an extra concentration of turnover at that top role. Yeah, we've seen a lot of those uh, sectors that you mentioned continue to have strength, uh, even following the pandemic, particularly in healthcare. I feel like every time I do an interview about the jobs market, that one maintains its strength. What about the sectors that we're starting to see some challenges in? Where do you think it's the hardest to get hired heading into 2024? Yeah, we continue to see the, the struggles uh, of job seekers in a few areas, and those are the ones that maybe overhired during uh, the COVID period because they saw this huge change in consumer demand for their products. So technology-based uh, companies that uh, shifted into uh, kind of extreme hiring mode for two years and then now are scaling back. Uh, we have seen, uh, while there is a lot of hiring happening in healthcare, we've also seen a lot of turnover there. Uh, so more volatility than most industries because like, like technology and like finance, uh, those were areas that really spiked and had to come back down to earth with uh, the changes that were, were happening uh, in the post-COVID period. Andy, two questions here real quick when it comes to AI. One, is that craze far from over when it comes to AI really driving some of that hiring momentum this year? And two, just how much have, do you think from your checks and the conversations that you're having with companies, how much has the AI technology really disrupted the hiring process? I think we're just at the very start of that. Uh, it's on the tip of every HR professional's tongues over the last year. Haven't gone a day without a conversation about it in many, many months. Uh, but the actual implementation of artificial intelligence into the hiring process is still in its nascent stages. We're going to see a lot more to come there. Uh, from the job seeker side, we are seeing job seekers starting to get smart and use artificial intelligence to create really well-crafted resumes and cover letters and extra correspondence that's targeted at every opportunity. Uh, and uh, employers are figuring out how to use that technology as well. Uh, I think we're going to see that kind of war in, in uh, uh, use of artificial intelligence in the uh, in the hiring process continue throughout 2024 and into the preceding years. All right, Andy Challenger, thanks so much for taking the time here to join us this morning. Senior Vice President and Head of Sales and Media at Challenger Gray and Christmas. Thanks.
Well, Fidelity marking down the value of X yet again, making the, making the case this time that X is worth 71.5% less than it was at the time that Elon Musk bought it with Fidelity's help. Now, for more on this, we want to get to Yahoo Finance reporter Dan Halley. Dan, this is just another uh, head scratcher here for Elon Musk, who certainly has not really been helping himself at X. That's right, Shawna. Yeah, this is uh, another uh, downgrade. According to uh, Axios, this is uh, Fidelity basically writing down their own share of X, uh, obviously privately held, so they don't really know uh, too much of the, the ins and outs. This is essentially their, their best guess as to what's going on uh, with the company itself. As, as, as of November, there was a 10.7% uh, write down, uh, and that, as you said, is the uh, overall is down 71.5% from that uh, $44 billion that Elon Musk had spent in late 2022 to purchase the social network. So, you know, this all kind of follows the various uh, negative reports out of X, whether that's Elon Musk uh, cursing out uh, big name advertisers like Disney, specifically uh, Disney CEO Bob Iger, uh, calling out companies that have pulled their ads from the, the platform because they don't want to be associated with certain types of content. Uh, Elon Musk's own posting uh, of controversial content, uh, you know, it just, uh, all seems to be kind of snowballing here into a, a broader problem. And it, it, it's it's unlikely that we would see the end of X. Uh, it's still bringing in uh, revenue, but it's far off of what uh, it was doing prior. Still, uh, there are people that continue to use it uh, on a regular basis, and, and Elon Musk is continuing to plow forward. Uh, but with this kind of you know loss we're seeing, you, you have to imagine there has to be some kind of dramatic re, uh, reinvention of the platform itself. Well, that's exactly where I want to go next, Dan. What does that dramatic reinvention have to look like to see a little bit of recovery in 2024 for X? Well, well obviously, they're leaning into the idea of subscriptions for, for the platform, uh, you know, with uh, X premium and things like that. But, you know, it just isn't going to make up for the amount of advertising dollars that they've, they've lost. Um, it's it's not an appealing product in and of itself, at least in my mind. Um, I don't really see a reason to pay more uh, for X than I would any other platform. I, I have a subscription for it, uh, but that's purely for work. Outside of work, I, I'm never on X. Um, you know, I, I can know a number of people who say the same, essentially. Uh, and increasingly, uh, you know, just anecdotally, I'm seeing a lot of people uh, on Meta's threads uh, as kind of, you know, the kind of wave pushes away. So, you know, for, for X itself, Elon Musk wants to turn it into a super app. Um, Linda Yaccarino is obviously trying to continue to get advertisers to, to want to come back. But, you know, I think the, the, the move is for them to continue to push towards that kind of super app idea but they have to try to get back the customers they alienated and the users they've alienated. Right, and the users that have already gotten used to using some uh, competing platforms there. Dan, thank you so much as always. Our thanks to our very own Dan Howley there. We're gonna have all of your markets action coming up ahead, but stay tuned with us. You're watching Yahoo Finance. If you can talk about one big theme for 2023, it has to be AI. The AI hype cycle has swept the nation this year. AI is still drawing a lot of attention. The AI boom. AI boom. Increasingly powerful AI models. AI. 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 Don't miss Yahoo Finance's coverage of CES 2024 in Las Vegas. We'll bring you the latest news, innovations, and big ideas in artificial intelligence.
Travel was strong this holiday season with the TSA screening more than 2.6 million passengers before Christmas alone. And airlines, well, it looks like they were able to keep up with the crowds. 2023 marking the lowest flight cancellation rate that we've seen in five years. We want to bring in Lindsay Schwimmer, Hopper's consumer travel expert. Lindsay, it's good to have you here. So it looks like airlines were able to keep up and keep up pace with the crowds that they saw over the holidays and really throughout 2023. So how does that set us up in terms of travel demand for 2024? We just came out of one of the busiest travel holiday seasons we've seen to date. So if that's any indicator of what we expect in 2024, we're expecting strong demand and Americans continuing to be eager to get back out there and take those trips in the new year. Lindsay, what does that demand look like? Where are you expecting to see con consumers spending money to travel most? Are you thinking domestic? Are you thinking international? We continue to see strong demand both domestically and internationally. Warm destinations like Florida, Mexico, the Caribbean are really topping the list for 2024, as well as those bigger bucket list international trips. So places across Europe, Asia are really popular, Tokyo, Paris for the 2024 Olympics. So we're really seeing trips across both domestic and international for 2024. Lindsay, how much are consumers paying? Are we going to see more relief? And if we are, then how much how much relief could consumers see relative to the prices that they paid last year? So good news for travelers, we're not going to be paying as much as we paid this time last year for trips. Airfare prices the first six months of the year are projected to be lower than what we saw in 2023. So if you are booking a trip both domestically and internationally, you're going to see some relief when you're booking those tickets. All right. Well, I love to hear that, Lindsay. But I know that one thing that's been challenging for a lot of the airlines that we cover here has been the lack of return of business travel because business travelers typically are booking some of those more expensive fares, as you know. What can you tell us about what business travel is expected to look like for 2024? We're continuing to see business travel make a comeback as we head into the new year. So expect to see big cities like New York City, big metro areas starting to see more demand on the business travel front as well as internationally. Lindsay, when it comes to some of the headwinds that consumers should be aware of or deal traps that maybe they could encounter over the next 12 months, what's your advice? I'd say always book with flexibility if you can avoid delays and cancellations. While delay and cancellation rates, as you mentioned earlier, are the lowest that we've seen since pre-pandemic, airlines will still be working to build capacity and maintain those low levels heading into the new year. We always recommend travelers add trip protection. We have something on Hopper and other providers called flight disruption assistance. That way you protect your trip, add peace of mind when you're booking those 2024 plans. Right, and that's a really important point, Lindsay, when you think about the advice for travelers. Um, I promise not to ask you a big econ question here, but we know that the U.S. dollar is expected to experience a lot of declines in the coming year. Can you talk to me a little bit about where consumers can travel, where their dollar can go further? Are there places uh, internationally where can consumers get a little bit of a deal moving forward? We're still seeing good deals abroad heading into 2024, as well as places in South America. So if you're looking to stretch your dollar a little further, look a little bit off the beaten path. You can sometimes find some really great deals and you'll be able to spend a little more once you actually get there. All right, Lindsay. Well, we really appreciate you joining us and giving us all that travel advice and insight. Thanks, Lindsay Schwimmer, Hopper consumer travel expert for joining us. Stick around here because we're going to have all of your markets action ahead. You're watching Yahoo Finance. If you can talk about one big theme for 2023, it has to be AI. The AI hype cycle has swept the nation this year. AI is still drawing a lot of attention. The AI boom. AI boom. Increasingly powerful AI models. AI. 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 Don't miss Yahoo Finance's coverage of CES 2024 in Las Vegas. We'll bring you the latest news, innovations, and big ideas in artificial intelligence.
We are watching shares of Moderna surge here this morning, up just about 11.5% among the top trending tickers here at Yahoo Finance today. The stock having its best day that we have seen since December 2022. Now, this all follows an upgrade from Oppenheimer to outperform. Moderna is the best performer in the S&P today and also the NASDAQ 100. While those indexes do remain in the red, Moderna helping just a bit. You're looking at the S&P off about 7 tenths of a percent. But let's talk about this call here with Moderna. Maddie, what was interesting to me was some of the points that the analysts uh, had made here. He sees increasing visibility on the COVID-19 vaccine sales. Not necessarily anything to be encouraged about this year. He does see a further decline, but he is optimistic about a rebound here looking ahead and also the potential for more commercial pro uh, products over the next couple of years. Yeah, this is something that we've heard not only from Moderna, but also for Pfizer, some new vaccines to come, because right now there's only one product available coming out of Moderna. They're seeking regulatory approval, both in the US and in Europe for an upcoming respiratory virus vaccine. That would be great news for those of us. Uh, I don't know about you, Sean, but noticing that everyone in the office has been sick lately, mm -hmm. so that would be great news to get one of those vaccines approved. Obviously, that's expected to come heading into 2025, and obviously, as we were Remember, takes a long time to get those regulatory approvals. Uh, also, because of some of the waning of demand for COVID-related products, that is potentially going to be a boon for Moderna as their operating expenses could start to decline this year, given that they're not necessarily going to have to spend as much on R&D. Yeah, we are seeing some uh, optimism here among its competitors. Taking a look at Pfizer, those shares are moving higher on this upgrade, as well as Novavax both in the green, uh, along with a massive jump that we're seeing from Moderna here this morning. So certainly a name to have on your radar, not only today, but also looking ahead to the rest of 2024, given some of the catalysts that Oppenheimer called out here in this upgrade. Yeah, it is interesting, though. It looks like uh, Bloomberg consensus that the company's losses are going to stretch into 2027. So a couple more years of losses for this name, uh, particularly given just the amount of investment they had in the COVID vaccine uh, creation. And then that stock down 40% over the last 12 months because of vaccine sales compression. Those sales are expected to hit a new low this year, but then again, anticipation of an increase in those sales in 2025, uh, anticipating an increase in need for booster shots as a potential boon for them, which is interesting. Yeah, Shana. and it's also to point, uh, important to point out there, just in terms of the valuation perspective, still well off the closing high that we saw back in 2021. So when you take a look at that longer term chart, shares still off about 70% from where it closed back on August 9th in 2021. But we are seeing some optimism here in today's trading with the stock up already 12% just about 90 minutes into the trading day. Well, speaking of some optimism, Shauna, we've got a fun story to talk about here. The original Mickey Mouse character now in the public domain. As of January 1st, the copyright for the original Mickey Mouse known as Steamboat Willie that was created back in 1928 can now be used by anyone in anything from art to movies. An earlier version of Minnie Mouse is also included in the change. So, Shauna, I know you've got two young kids at home. Uh, how much Mickey Mouse is in your life these days? We watch a heck of a lot of Mickey Mouse, and actually my two-year-old, it's his favorite uh, character right now. So we got a lot of Mickey Mouse themed toys over the holidays. But this just points to the fact that Mickey Mouse, obviously a character to no one's surprise, has spanned <laughs> generations. When it comes to Steamboat Willie, this uh, copyright uh, release here comes more than 95 years after it was first introduced by Walt Disney in Steamboat Willie. So the original versions of Mickey and Minnie Mouse have now entered the public domain as of this week. And it is a bit controversial because you got to remember what happened last year with yeah. Winnie the Pooh after the after Winnie the Pooh lost its copyright, entered the public domain. There was a lot of controversy around that new film, Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey, which I think for valid reason here, yeah. just in terms of how it totally shifts the narrative branding, right? of a character here that so many people have uh, come to know and love over the years. But again, this iconic duo that so many households uh, obviously have followed now for years, entering the public domain as of this week. So we'll see. Yeah. What's to come here? Yeah, a lot of whether or not there's some more uh, movies that maybe wouldn't have necessarily been produced uh, by Disney because of the narrative, and maybe it could change a little bit. Hopefully not, though. Hopefully not. A lot of a lot of to your point, though. Uh, new public domain news coming up this week, Shauna. All right, well, let's do a quick check of the markets here because the first trading day of 2024, and we're looking at losses here, at least for the S&P and the Nasdaq. You look at the Nasdaq leading the sell-off, nearly. 
2%. A lot of that concern is stemming from the downgrade that we saw from Barclays downgrading Apple with Apple shares taking a big hit. One of the big draggers in the S&P 500, you look at the S&P off just about 7 tenths of a percent. Despite that, you still have the Dow trading just around the flat line. Taking a look at their sector action here this morning, lots of focus on sector performance coming out of what was a very, very strong year for tech and communication services in 2023. Taking a look at the early action here in 2024, you've got energy among the leaders, healthcare, as well as utilities. Biggest decliners, to no surprise, because that Apple downgrade, you're looking at technology, the XLK off nearly 3%, also consumer discretionary and communication services underperforming. So a bit of a shift here as we start the new year for 2024. That's all from us today. But keep right here on Yahoo Finance. Rochelle Kufo has you for the next hour. Welcome to Yahoo Finance. It's 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Rochelle Akufo. Here's a look at what I'm watching this morning. Apple hit with a rare downgrade this morning, pulling broader tech stocks lower this morning with it. We'll speak with a panel of analysts coming up this hour. 
And Bitcoin jumping above $45,000 for the first time since April of 2022. That's on further optimism surrounding a spot Bitcoin ETF. What this signals for the cryptocurrency in the new year. Plus, New Year, new public debut. Pinstripes is making its public debut via SPAC on the New York Stock Exchange today. We'll speak with the company's CEO later this hour. But first, let's take a look at how the markets are faring so far this morning. Looking at a mixed picture, although the Dow just barely in the green, they're up about 12 points on the day. The S&P 500 also under pressure, they're down 0.7%. Tech heavy Nasdaq seeing the biggest losses so far, down about 1.7%. That Apple downgrade effect on the Nasdaq dragging down tech in the S&P 500, making tech the laggard in terms of sectors. And also chip makers also feeling the pain, adding to the woes there as ASML reportedly pressured by the Biden administration to halt shipments of some high-end chip making equipment to China. So a bit of a mixed picture so far. Well, let's check in on how this is all affecting the treasury market as well. We have seen the VIX pick up a little bit there in terms of volatility, but looking at the five year, currently looking at the yields up more than 2% on the day. The 10 year also gaining some ground up almost 2% on the day as well. And the longest term 30 year yield that up 1.7% sitting at 409. Well, it's the first week of trading in 2024 and we've got a ton going on with some lingering earnings sprinkled throughout the week, some Fed speak Wednesday and of course big data ending with the jobs report on Friday. Here with what we should expect from that first jobs report of the year is our very own Josh Schaefer. Happy New Year to you, Josh. Rochelle, happy new year. It is 2024 and economists are telling me that the biggest story in 2024 is going to be the labor market. Yes, of course, we're still going to be talking about inflation. But when we think about that soft landing, we need the economy to hold up and we need the labor market to hold up as it has. So what I'm sitting next to right now is the expectations for the December jobs report. So you can see this would be a little bit of a tick down with 168,000 jobs added. That's compared to 199. Unemployment rate would be up slightly 3.8% from 3.7%. But overall, this picture here fits the narrative we've been talking about of a cooling labor market, but not one that's ice cold, not one that's going into recession. But that is what people are watching for in 24, in these first three labor reports we're going to get, or four labor reports we're going to get before the Fed's March meeting when a lot of people expect the Fed to cut. Because some people think we need to see these numbers come significantly down. To give you an example of what I'm talking about, we're talking about non-farm payrolls maybe being 50000 a month by March. That's something Morgan Stanley has called for if they're, if they're going to see a cut come in March. Take a look at that unemployment rate. Currently at 3.8%. Deutsche Bank thinks that number, this number right here, unemployment at 3.8, could go all the way up to 45 when we get a mild recession this year. That's their call is for a mild recession. So we're going to see big shifts in these numbers if that is to happen. And then just to give you a sense of what that would look like on the charts here, I mean, we're talking if non-farm payrolls came all the way down to 50,000, you can see that's just significantly lower than the hot labor market we've had. Remember, 199,000 last month. And then to give you another graphical look at the unemployment rate, we're currently at 3.7%. For it to tick up over 4%, maybe closer to 4.5%, we're talking about a significant increase in unemployment here. Again, this is what economists are trying to figure out if we're going to get that slowdown. That is not something that is definitely going to happen. But if we were to go up above 4 that seems to be a little bit of a line in the sand where economists are starting to get worried about the unemployment rate going up. Because we know if the unemployment rate starts ticking up month after month, that usually feeds on itself and it can get quite high. So overall on Friday, we're looking for more signs of cooling and making sure things aren't getting too cold. It's that porridge, Rochelle, right? You got to make sure that it tastes just right. And right now, that's what the data has been giving us. But we'll see what we get this week. Indeed, hoping for that Goldilocks scenario. We'll have to see. Appreciate you breaking all that down for us. Our very own Josh Schaefer. Well, we're taking a look at Apple shares still in ter- negative territory this morning, down more than 3%. This comes after Barclays downgraded the stock to underweight and lowered its price target by a dollar. The bank's analyst, Tim Long, saying the current iPhone sales are lackluster and there was a lack of bounce back in Macs, iPads and wearables. Our next guests are keeping an eye on Apple's performance and how the company will continue to engage with customers in the US and abroad. 
Let's bring in Gil Luria, DA Davidson Managing Director, as well as Martin Young, Oppenheimer Senior Analyst of Emerging Technologies and Services. A big welcome to you both here. So it's worth noting that in this note, um, they talked most specifically about the iPhone 15's performance in China and it really signaled that as broader weakness potentially for the iPhone 16 and some of the other hardware sales. So. Uh, Gil, I want to start with you here because you are in that sort of same sort of camp in terms of having a neutral rating and you have a $166 price target. What concerns you most about the reports coming out from Apple? Well, it's not necessarily reports from this holiday season. We're not going to actually know how many iPhones they sold until they tell us. All these checks are very, very partial. There's a lot of moving pieces. There's a week less of sales, but there's better supply chain. There's restrictions in China but there's some aging uh, hardware in the market as well. So we're not going to actually know. But what we do know is that growth isn't going to be very fast, not for the iPhone or for any of the other hardware categories. Apple is really just growing its services business this, at this point, and that's not enough to generate any more than just low single-digit revenue growth this year after a pretty flat year last year. That's our concern is that unless they unclog their innovation rut, then it's going to be very hard for this company to accelerate growth on the hardware side. Now, Martin, you have a $200 price target here and you have an outperform rating. But when you look at the, the stock price reaction to this downgrade, do you think it's overblown or do you think it's fairly justified? Uh, in the near term, it's probably justified. We're seeing uh, really deceleration of Apple's sure gain uh, momentum uh, in China and in uh, developed markets in recent quarters. Uh, but in the longer term, I think uh, it will correct itself because we do see a very stable active install base uh, that will help to uh, maintain a very strong uh, service revenue growth for the longer term for Apple. So, Gil, obviously, this is just, just one of the issues that Apple has been facing. You have this downgrade here. You have, obviously, the, the issues it was having with its watch as well. When you look at the top issues that are facing Apple, how much of a moat do you think it has here? Well, it has a very large installed base, which is why it can continue to grow the services business. The services business is really a function of how big the installed base, and they have hundreds of millions of products out there in installed base in, in almost every category. The challenge is, how do you keep people wanting to upgrade their phones, which is more than half the sales? What are you going to do to make the phone look different than the iPhone 12 and 13 and 14? It still looks the same. There's very little innovation happening. They need to change that in order to drive growth in hardware. That's the first problem. The second challenge that we have to look out for is the regulatory challenge to the services business. Part of the reason they can have such success in growing that business is that the only app store on the iPhone is Apple's app store. If they ever have to open it up and allow for other app stores on the iPhone, because of regulatory pressure in Europe or elsewhere, that's another challenge you have to look out for going forward. And Martin, how does that factor into what you're looking at in terms of price target and whether or not you can really justify this sort of stock price for Apple here? Sure, I will always look at um, the consumer uh, experience provided by Apple versus other potential alternatives and poten uh, versus other uh, competitors. When you measure uh, the amount of hardware innovation or the measure of the amount of consumer convenience provided by Apple App Store, Apple is still the best in class. So we don't see any uh, potential share loss, um, um, potential share loss threat uh, coming from a opening up of the App Store ecosystem because Apple by default provide the best consumer experience and convenience. And uh, we don't think there's any uh, meaningful downside uh, with um, you know, uh, what's happening in EO or what's happening elsewhere, uh, maybe in Asia. And Gil, I mean, we know that Tim Cook, I mean, he's he's a services guy. He's he's the software guy. We're not going to have the same sort of innovations that we saw, you know, previously under Steve Jobs. But in terms of what the consumer then is looking for from Apple, what's going to get that innovation going? What's going to be the next catalyst for Apple? Well, so that's the thing. It, it, the software is great. The experience is great. The consumers love it. But from the other side, from the providers of the applications, the experience isn't great. They have to pay 
a disproportionate amount of their revenue to Apple. And so that's one of the challenges Apple has to get through is to make sure that they can keep all those app providers in the store. In terms of a positive catalyst, again, we need a new form factor, uh, thinner phones, bigger phones, lighter phones, brighter phones, uh, something uh, like the AI pin, like a folding phone. We need some innovation. When we see some innovation, I think that'll be a positive catalyst. The place we're actually looking for that is generative AI. Apple has such great data in its closed garden ecosystem of consumers that it can train to help us generate better, more useful generative content for consumers uh, that, that goes farther than just text autocomplete. We love text autocomplete or, or we don't, but they can do a lot more with generative AI. That's where I think some of the positive catalysts can come from when they show us what they're working on on that innovative front. And Martin, a lot of people are wondering when we're really going to see Apple make its move here. Sometimes it's nice to sort of sit back, wait to, you know, to, as we see sort of some of this develop and then come out with an incredible product. I mean, so far, really haven't seen much of that, perhaps in its virtual reality and AR headsets. But how confident are you, Martin, about where Apple could take generative AI based on what you're seeing so far? Uh, sure. I think uh, Apple has a very predictable path. Uh, of new software feature announcements that will be at every year um, uh, in June at their WWDC conference. So uh, in the upcoming WWDC conference in June 2024, we are likely to see a lot more announcement relating to on-device uh, large language models uh, that we should expect in the upcoming iOS 18. And I would also highlight that Apple because of the unique hardware architecture of unified uh, memory architecture that uh, position uh, the upcoming iPhone devices or iOS devices to be more um, efficient uh, and implementing large language models uh, on device. So that creates a potential competitive edge versus other iPhone, uh, other smartphone devices uh, at how they approach a large uh, or uh, how they approach large language models or chat GPT like features uh, of running on the smartphone devices without a you know constant internet connections. I mean, you figure when you're Apple, you know, heavy is the head that wears the crown. Always ex high expectations when it comes to Apple. Appreciate you both joining me this morning. Gil Laurie, DA Davidson Managing Director, as well as Martin Young, Oppenheimer Senior Analyst of Emerging Technologies and Services. Thank you and Happy New Year to you both. Thank you. Happy New Year. Well, we heard from several EV makers this morning reporting their latest delivery numbers. Let's start, of course, with Tesla, a top trending ticker on Yahoo Finance, shares up after its fourth quarter delivery numbers beat estimates with almost 485,000 deliveries for the fourth quarter, bringing its 2023 total to 1.8 million vehicles. But it wasn't enough to beat rival BYD. The Chinese EV maker selling over 526,000 fully electric vehicles in the fourth quarter, that's according to Bloomberg. Now that's over 40,000 more units than Tesla. And Rivian rounding them out, delivering nearly 14,000 vehicles in the fourth quarter, that's 10% below the previous three months. The stock sinking on that news being punished to the tune of more than 9% so far this morning. Meanwhile, Bitcoin is on fire today, surpassing $45,000 for the first time in nearly two years. We dive into the crypto market's moves on the other side of this break. Stay with us. We're here in Las Vegas, Nevada, outside of the Skier. It's the massive music and entertainment venue that opened a few months ago. But the real reason we're in Sin City is for CES 2024. It's one of the largest tech shows on earth and we're gonna be bringing you all of the news, innovations, and ideas hey, hey, out of- Hey, hold on, we're not in Vegas, man. <laughs> we're still in New York, and that's not the sphere, it's a cube. Ah, oh, I'm gonna miss my flight. Oh, taxi. Don't miss Yahoo Finance's coverage of CES 2024 in Las Vegas.
Bitcoin swinging over $45,000 today for the first time since 2022. Now this comes amid growing optimism we'll see approvals for the first spot Bitcoin ETFs. For more on this, we turn to Yahoo Finance's David Hollerith. David, seeing some of this enthusiasm from last year still swinging into the new year. Yeah, hey, hey, Rochelle, uh, happy 2024. Um, Bitcoin's price hasn't stood this high since April two years ago. Um, and, you know, that it was also about a uh, month before the blow ups that shook 2022 for the industry. Um, another recent trend we've actually noticed, too, has been the return of Bitcoin advertisements. So between the price and the ads, both of these appear to be around the revolving speculative but growing chance of U.S. spot Bitcoin ETFs to be listed later this month. Um, so just to give you some context, it's a pretty mainstream moment for sort of an asset class that has kind of stood on the fringes, you know, if we look back to it historically. Um, and both these things are effectively, uh, you know, hedged around whether or not or uh, when these ETFs launch. And the SEC notoriously has, you know, been tough and a, a tough enforcer of crypto this year. On that front, um, on Friday, we saw a, a number of the asset managers that want to list a Bitcoin spot ETF um, update their applications. Um, not a lot new there. Um, and since the weekend, nothing else has happened. But obviously, momentum sort of growing and a lot of people were off last week. Um, issuers we've spoken with have set their expectations to keep an eye out for between Thursday, January 4th, which is this Thursday, and Monday, January 8th. Uh, the ultimate uh, deadline for approval of a spot Bitcoin ETF is set for January 10th. So the launch of Bitcoin related products in the past has usually coincided with a run up in uh, prices like we have seen um, in this uh, time period as we're waiting for the potential approval of a spot product. Now, what has traders excited about this year is that historically um, that's tended to uh, be sort of a sell the news event that has not um, been great and it's kind of coincided with uh, largely the end of, of kind of Bitcoin's bull run. Um, and given where Bitcoin is trading now and some other positive or potentially positive events that are sort of expected to come this year, um, there's sort of some hopefulness that um, this will not be necessarily the end of, of the positive signs and signals for Bitcoin in 2024. Um, so all that to say, there's a growing optimism around around these products. Not a lot new has changed since the weekend. We'll continue to watch that. I remember all the celebrity endorsements and all the Super Bowl commercials just you know a few years ago, and now you didn't see any of them. It'll be interesting to see what happens. And of course, looking forward to the Bitcoin halving event. It's supposed to be coming up in April as well. I know you'll be tracking all of that for us. Our very own David Hollerith. Thank you so much. Well, Maersk is halting Red Sea shipping until further notice. This comes after Houthi rebels attempted to attack the shipping company's vessel over the weekend. As supply disruption fears continue to grow, what's next for oil prices? To break it down for us, Yahoo Finance reporter Ines Ferre here with the latest. Hey, Ines. Hey, Rochelle. Yeah, and we saw oil spi prices spike at more than 2.5% earlier this morning for both WTI and Brent crude, and they have since pared back those gains. But let's take a look at some of the action that we saw throughout the session today. Here's an intraday, and you're looking at WTI that's down more than 1% right now. Brent crude is down about 1%. So you had this spike earlier this morning, up more than 2%, as I mentioned. This was after Iran deployed a warship to the Red Sea. This came after the U.S. Navy destroyed three Houthi ships on Sunday, after the U.S. said that it had received a distressed call from a Maersk shipping vessel, uh, an apparent uh, hijacking that was apparently uh, taking place. So Maersk uh, suspended its shipments for 48 hours, as you had mentioned. And you'll recall that earlier in December, December, uh, you had several shipping giants which had been suspending um, their shipments throughout the Red Sea, uh, which connects to the Suez Canal. And it is a short uh, area. It's, it's an area through which shipments, many shipments go through oil and other types of shipments uh, where you get goods from Europe to uh, Asia. 
So you have increasing costs now and travel times if these ships are to be diverted. And you had one analyst that was saying that the escalation of tensions between the U.S. and Iran has caught some fund managers by surprise and they're bringing on some long positions. We are seeing the U.S. dollar index is going higher, so that is putting some pressure on oil prices. And we also saw oil prices kind of come down throughout the session today after you had that PMI data print that came out that's showing further contraction for the month of December. So you've got really some demand concerns that are overshadowing these rising tensions in the Red Sea. Last year was a volatile year for oil, oil down 10% uh, last year, both for WTI and uh, Brent crude. This year, analysts are expecting another volatile year. Rochelle? We'll certainly be keeping track of that. Of course, a major election year globally, which would also be tracking some of the geopolitical impacts there as well. Our very own Ines Frey, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, coming up, are investors overly optimistic about the 2024 market? We'll talk to a cautious strategist next. We're here in Las Vegas, Nevada, outside of the sphere. It's the massive music and entertainment venue that opened a few months ago. But the real reason we're in Sin City is for CES 2024. It's one of the largest tech shows on earth. And we're going to be bringing you all of the news, innovations, and ideas hey, hey, out of- Hey, hold on. We're not in Vegas, man. <laughs> We're still in New York, and that's not the sphere. It's a cube. Oh, I'm going to miss my flight. Oh, taxi. Don't miss Yahoo Finance's coverage of CES 2024 in Las Vegas.
We're about two hours into the first trading day of 2024. The S&P and Nasdaq taking a hit, but many strategists are optimistic about where the market is heading through year end. We've covered several bullish calls for the S&P 500, but our next guest is more cautious. We have Burns McKinney, NFJ Investment Group Managing Director and Senior Portfolio Manager joining me this morning. And Happy New Year to you. So I want to break some of this down because a lot of people are still feeling very bullish now, but could it be that a lot of the, the gains have already been taken at the end of the year and we're just sort of treading water at this point as we're looking ahead to potentially six rate cuts that some, some investors are pricing in? That's definitely a possibility. I mean, the way I've sort of been viewing it is that, that the stock market had a great 2024 during the fourth quarter of 2023. Mm -hmm. And you know, you, you've seen really the, the one you know, fulcrum upon which you know, stocks have been trading on for the last really 12 months have been what's going on with interest rates. And so when you had the great pivot of, of 2023, when the Fed said, okay, we're going to move from, from rate hikes to rate cuts, um, the markets you know, moved pretty quickly. There is some concern they might've gotten ahead of themselves a little bit. I mean, it's sort of, you know, I like to think there's a there's an old book, you know, you, you, you give a mouse a cookie, you know, you know, because you give a mouse a cookie, he's going to ask for milk. You ask, give him milk, and so on and so on. And that's kind of how the stock market is a little bit. You know, you, 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 the Fed tells the markets, okay, maybe we might cut rates three times in 2024. And the markets say, hey, no, how about six times? And you know, as a result of the fact that they've already, in many ways, priced that in, um, you know, a lot of those gains may have been had. If you think about, well, what are the ways that the market could you know, appreciate it at a, at a fast pace in 2024? I mean, you've got you know the S&P's trading at you know 21 times earnings. You shouldn't expect a lot of multiple appreciation. We've gotten that. Earnings are forecast to grow at 10 to 12 percent. So that's that's pretty optimistic too. And we're already pricing in six rate cuts. And so I think the risk reward is is perhaps behind us a little bit. That said, I mean I think that you know you know interest rates you know will be coming down a little bit. And so yeah, you know, it, it's hard to really you know warn against fighting the Fed and fighting the markets on that front. It's true. So then what do you make of the breadth of the rally that we've had so far? Obviously, a lot of focus on the Magnificent Seven, but also small caps as well. Yeah, I think that's that's one of the best stories that came out of the Fed pivot last quarter was um, really, you know, you know, everything rally. It had sort of we call it the everything rally and you know, everything moved pretty quickly. But what was kind of interesting to us and exciting about it is that the breadth did expand. You kind of went from the you know, the magnificent seven to the, you know, the, the mundane 493. And, you know, you saw small caps do well. You saw a lot of what actually hadn't performed well in 2023 um, really rally, whether it's some of the, the, the interest rate sensitive names like utilities or REITs, uh, you know, some of the financials, even regional banks did pretty well. And so that is one thing that investors can kind of look forward to in 2023 is that, you know, maybe don't go all in on the market, but it should be a good market for stock pickers based on the fact that, um, yeah, you know, with that expansion, you know, the other, you know, the the rest of the market outside of you know that magnificent seven has really gone, hasn't gone anywhere for the last couple of years. And so, you know, there's some areas where earnings have continued to grow, and as a result, valuations are more appealing. But you do need to be a bit more selective this year rather than just going in and just you know loading up on the S and P five hundred. So, of course, as we look at the inflation story here, looking at what the economic picture is telling us, given that still some of the Fed's medicine hasn't made it all the way through the economy, when you look at labor force participation, when you look at where rents are headed, what is that signaling about where the opportunities are ahead and what markets should be paying attention to? Well, inflation definitely is, is falling uh, you know, even more quickly than investors have been you know, taking account for. I, if you look at you know, core inflation over just the last three months, you annualize that, you know, you're talking in the, the mid 2% range. And in fact, the biggest driver of that has been shelter costs. And, you know, those are kind of, you know, that's kind of stale data. If you look at real time data for that and plug that in, inflation may already be at the Fed's target. So one of the reasons the Fed does have the ability to cut rates this year is just simply the fact it's not that they're cutting rates because, you know, to, to combat a, a recession or economic weakness, they're just cutting them just to kind of keep up with inflation to, to keep from actually becoming um, more restrictive. And so, you know, that bodes well for, you know, economically sensitive, um, you know, places like value stocks should actually, you know, do pretty well. In general, um, that's one area of the market that has lag. You know, we're looking at reversion of the mean. And, you know, for example, the you know, the U.S. large cap index has lagged the, the U.S. growth index by several hundred basis points per year over the last five years, the last 10 years. As a result, the discount to which it trades to large caps is, 
is much wider than uh, its historical average levels. And so, um, you know, we are suggesting to our clients to, you know, maybe focus on um, kind of, you know, looking, you know, looking between the, the sofa cushions, looking under the mattress at some of those um, unloved value stocks that might have a chance to make a comeback this year. So Burns, give us some names, some of your picks that you like in this environment. Sure. I think one that, that stands out because of the fact that, you know, utilities sector, again, you know, we don't necessarily see big double digit gains this year. And the utilities space is one that did lag last year. And as a result, you know, there's some values to be had. Uh, one that jumps out would be uh, Next Era Energy. I mean, it was a, a huge laggard in, in 2023. And as a result, you know, it typically trades at a nice premium. That premium has gone. I mean, that's a name that right now, you know, you get into Next Era at around 18 times earnings. This is actually the first time that Next Era um, has traded a discount to the S&P 500 since 2017. Uh, among utilities, it doesn't have the highest absolute dividend yield, but it has some of the best growing dividends. They've tripled their dividend payout in the last um, over the last 10 years. And you know, for those who aren't familiar, you know what Next Era is? It's a it's a, the largest electric utility in Florida. Which on that front, you're getting um, a, a company where. You've got positive population growth demographics. Uh, you have a very friendly regulatory regime. But typically what you'd end up paying a premium for is the fact that it's also the U.S. leader in clean and renewable energy. And you know, oftentimes you pay a premium for that. You're basically getting that side of the business for free, um, You know, just sort of getting ahead of the game on the ESG front. And for people who got ahead of the game when it came to the bond market, what are the expectations here? Given the volatility that we saw towards the end of last year, what should we expect going into this year when you have the Fed, the Fed pausing and potentially pivoting at some point? You know, I, volatility should probably remain at a somewhat elevated level, I think, just as a result of the fact of the you know, the policy uncertainty and that, you know, you are having a, a bit of a sea change with respect to what um, you know, you've got the just central bank policy. Um, you know, there is a lot of uncertainty this year with respect to both that as well as geopolitics. I mean, you know, we have, you know, whether it's, you know, the, the war in the Middle East, a war in Ukraine. And, you know, the fact, I think, you know, one thing that, that could throw a monkey wrench into a lot of space is you have um, elections being held around the world in addition just to the U.S. election. I think that's something that, you know, may keep investors on their toes. And so, you know, if one is going to expect to see volatility, I think, you know, one way investors can kind of play that or at least try to blunt that volatility is look for names that maybe don't necessarily move quite so widely with the markets. You know, one place that jumps to mind would be, um, you know, stocks that pay and grow dividends because, you know, we always say that, you know, capital gains of a name can be positive and negative, but the dividend component of return, that's always positive. And so the dividend payers have historically, over at least rolling periods, have always uh, tended to be less volatile than the uh, the broader um, stock market. Certainly some, some caution to note ahead, even if markets, at least for now, not paying that much attention to it. I appreciate you joining me this morning. Burns McKinney, NFJ Investment Group Managing Director and Senior Portfolio Manager. Thank you so much. Yeah. Right, now time for our chant of the day. There are $117 billion of debt in commercial mortgages tied to offices due in 2024. That's according to data from the Mortgage Bankers Association. Now, unlike U.S. home loans, commercial mortgages are almost completely interest only, which means developers of large properties usually have lower monthly payments, but make large payments equal to the original loan when that mortgage becomes due. Now, for current owners, mortgage rates have nearly doubled since then, and many buildings have seen poor rental performance since the pandemic. While the Mortgage Bankers Association is expecting losses to be smaller than in the 2008 housing crisis, Moody's Analytics estimates that of the 605 buildings with mortgages expiring soon, there are 224 owners that will have trouble refinancing this year. That's a sector we'll continue to track for you here on Yahoo Finance. All right, coming up, are SPACs hoping to pick up a spare in 2024? The bistro, bowling and bocce company Pinstripes making its public debut today. We dive into that next. Good morning, Wall Street. Straight from Yahoo Finance is front page to your mobile phones and to your streaming apps. Watch our new flagship show, The Morning Brief, your first stop as we guide you through the day's market action. We give you insights into the latest market moving news, real time analysis of today's top stories, and actionable information about your investments. We bring you the opening bell on Wall Street. And don't miss our strategy sessions with Wall Street's top analysts. 
It's the morning brief. It's the morning brief. The morning brief. Yahoo Finance's morning brief, empowering you to make smart investing decisions. Tune in daily at 9 a.m. Eastern. Twenty twenty three will always be known as the year of the great AI boom. Investment and excitement around AI pushing tech stocks higher to end the year. And companies like NVIDIA saw extraordinary gains. But now investors are turning attention to the risks that AI may pose. And last week we saw a big one with the New York Times suing OpenAI and Microsoft over copyright infringement. Several other groups also sued AI companies in 2023. So the question now is, is copyright law the biggest risk to generative AI in the new year? For more on this, we turn to Yahoo Finance's own Dan Howley. Hey, Dan. That's right. We're looking at kind of the ongoing changing landscape when it comes to generative AI. And as you said, Rochelle, you know, part of this now has to come down to copyright. Uh, basically, just, you know, as a general background, these AI systems are trained on millions and millions of uh, data points. Those can include news articles or uh, different posts online. And I mean, it's just generally the internet that these are usually trained on, especially the public ones. Um, and so what you end up with is questions of, are copyrighted articles, 
uh, books, things along those lines being used to train these systems. And so far, we've seen several lawsuits come out, uh, as you noted, the most uh, recent being the New York Times against OpenAI and Microsoft. The question is whether or not those copyrighted materials were used on the training. And so we've seen some pushback uh, on these kinds of questions. There's been some cases uh, where uh, people who are filing suits have been kind of told by uh, the court, you have to be more specific about whether there are actually your products uh, in these platforms uh, that that has to do uh, on the side of things uh, with art itself, uh, whether you're a, a painter or, or or artist, things along those lines. Uh, if those kind of visual generative AI platforms have used uh, your art on the written side of things, uh, there's questions as to whether or not uh, the material continues to exist or if it's any different than, say, a search engine uh, bringing up information about your uh, own article and then showing it there. Uh, so there's there's a lot of questions here that still need to be sussed out. And so, you know, it, it it isn't likely that we'll see these kinds of platforms, you know, evaporate because of this. This isn't necessarily an existential threat to them, but it is something that companies are going to have to be careful about going forward. Uh, there's a lot to do uh, with copyright and the internet, uh, obviously, as I said, uh, when it comes to even, even search engines, social media, these questions have, have kind of already been answered uh, in the past. So now we're going to have to see if they can apply to these kinds of generative AI systems. And so, you know, as we see more companies, not only develop them, but uh, their clients start to use them, that's going to be a question that needs to be answered going forward. Indeed, that legal minefield, we saw it starting with creatives and musicians, but now really expanding beyond, you know, authors and writers as well. We'll continue to track that. I appreciate you as always. Yahoo Finance reporter, Dan Howley. All right, well, we're watching shares of Pinstripes trading lower after making its public debut via a SPAC merger today. The dining and entertainment brand trading on the New York Stock Exchange under the ticker PNST. For more on this, we turn to Dale Schwartz, Pinstripes founder and CEO. Welcome to the show and thank you for joining us this morning. Um, congratulations, of course, on this SPAC merger. So walk us through the decision to go public via SPAC versus your traditional IPO. Sure, and a happy new year to you as well. Uh, we certainly were considering accessing the public market for the last five years just to uh, raise some attractive permanent capital. The SPAC market, we were not uh, averse to being a bit of a contrarian, and it allowed us to go public, frankly, last year. So we were the last company on New York Stock Exchange to go public and the first that'll list uh, as we did just this morning. And so, Dale, for people who aren't familiar with the brand, I mean, I'm in D.C., so I know we, we have one of these over here. But talk about the appeal of this brand, especially at a time where we are starting to see consumers perhaps tighten their purse strings more than usual as they're living with the, the lingering effects of inflation. Sure. Well, everything we do is to connect people and have people gather, celebrate and time and spend time together. Uh, that certainly was accentuated during COVID. Uh, Zoom is effective, but not as exciting as just spending quality time together. So that's what we do. 17 years ago, we started. That was the original passion vision, still is. And with the Amazon effect and a lot of the trends for experiential, uh, we're, we're, we're right in the sweet spot in doing so. And, and frankly, one of the key differentiators with us is if, if you have been, Rochelle, to Georgetown and Bethesda in the greater DC market, our food is phenomenal. So our Scratch Kitchen is one of the key differentiators, as is our private event space. We do weddings and over a thousand private events a year at each location. And it's interesting because Pinstripes, it, it does really connect a lot of different things. You mentioned services, you mentioned food, obviously activities as well. So talk about expansion plans. When you're looking at, at particular cities, what are you looking for in the demographics or in the region when you're looking for the most upside that you can get for your locations? Sure. Well, expansion, we're planning to open about 150 Pinstripes locations all over the U.S., Internationally, we'll look to do an equal number with partners. And when we're opening locations, we, 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 we like the education and sophisticated markets. Uh, we certainly also like to cluster locations. So Georgetown, Bethesda is a good example. 
as is San Mateo and Walnut Creek coming in a few months, and we have four locations in Chicago. Uh, we also quite like the attractive co-tenancies of a lot of high quality projects that are being redeveloped. So in Topanga, we're next to Air Maze. We're off the next to Apple. So that, that all of that is what informs our site selection. And so in terms of international expansion, then what are some of the markets that you're looking at there? Being that it is still a very uncertain environment in terms of you know, how different countries are battling inflation and different governments are, are incentivizing and the cost of living still relatively high for people. Yeah, well, our view was that internationally, all of the same experiential trends pre-COVID were maybe lagging international markets by a couple of years. Uh, some of thanks to COVID, uh, there is no lag. Uh, everybody in the UK, Australia, Dubai, et cetera, didn't have an option but to transact online. So we're looking uh, and have been looking for a number of years in those markets, Mexico City, and, and quite a number of others, uh, much like some of our peers that have forge partnerships overseas, uh, we'll look to do the same. But the overall dynamics and trends and appetite, pun intended, towards experiential dining entertainment uh, is there overseas. So, Dale, when you think about your biggest competitors in this space, would it be some of these complexes like, like a Dave & Buster's that caters to sort of, you know, a, a broad audience? Or who would you say is your biggest competition in this space? Is it restaurants? Is it some of these other these activity areas? Sure. Uh, so with respect to entertainment, uh, we, we do in some respects compete with a David Buster's, a Top Golf, a Putch Axe, some of the other players that are uh, both combining entertainment and dining. We also compete with, on occasion, the Park Hyatts in the Four Seasons uh, for weddings. Uh, and and those hotels often quite like us because of all the hotel room bookings. Uh, and then we'll also compete against traditional restaurants uh, for our traditional lunch, dinner, uh, happy hour bar business. So we, we touch a lot of touch points and compete with a lot of different players, but we're so unique that, that we, we often uh, stand alone in terms of our differentiators. And just quickly, Dale, what's your bowling average, by the way? Not particularly good. Uh, my my <laughs> high was about 18, 18 years ago. I got lucky and bowled at 222. Um, I, 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 I'd probably break 100 if I was on the lanes today, but not 200. Mine is non existence. I have no room to talk. I'll be there for the snacks <laughs> and to root everybody else on. Appreciate you joining right. us this morning. Dale Schwartz, Finstripe's founder and CEO, and Happy New Year to you. No, likewise. Thank you. All right, coming up, we're ringing in a new year for retail. We'll break down the top three things to watch in the retail space this year, next. Good morning, Wall Street. Straight from Yahoo Finance's front page to your mobile phones and to your streaming apps. Watch our new flagship show, The Morning Brief. Your first stop as we guide you through the day's market action. We give you insights into the latest market moving news, real-time analysis of today's top stories and actionable information about your investments. We bring you the opening bell on Wall Street. And don't miss our strategy sessions with Wall Street's top analysts. It's the Morning Brief. It's the Morning Brief. The Morning Brief. Yahoo Finance's Morning Brief, empowering you to make smart investing decisions. Tune in daily at 9 a.m. Eastern.
T.D. Cowan out this with a note this morning about retail trends for the new year. Yahoo Finance's Brooke De Palma is here with the highlights. Hey, Brooke, and Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you too, Rochelle. Good morning. Certainly, 2023 was a resilient consumer environment where consumers seem to put up with higher prices. But now, heading into 2024, and I mean, we're already here, consumers are being a bit more choiceful this year, a bit more discerning about how exactly they're planning to shop and where exactly they plan to shop. And according to that new note from TD Cowan, we expect to see a more value-seeking consumer. We expect to see a consumer that is very into DIY and really looking for ways to save and ultimately they will trade up selectively so perhaps on things like perfume perhaps on little luxuries like lotion but ultimately dupes those cheap alternatives will be the name of the game in 2024 and that might be good news for the Costco's Kirkland brand as well as Walmart's great value brand. So we might see an increase in consumers turning to private labels. But in addition to that, consumers will also be picking those timeless, perhaps black blazers over a hit uh, on trend piece like those snazzy sneakers that we've seen run up in the end of 2023. And another thing to look out for is that Chinese e-commerce boom. Lots of attention on Xi and Timu. And those are certainly gaining more momentum Heading into, the, heading into this year with those low-cost, on-trend fashion. And as you can see here, another theme of this year is the rise of AI. Now, the adoption of AI in retail as well as consumer product industry is projected to leap from 40% of companies using AI today to more than 80% in three years. That's according to a new study from IBM. And AI is really being used across the board from machine learning to predict and prescribe trends. We're seeing it in labor and automation. And in addition to that, it's really being used throughout the entire process from shopping online to price optimization and those returns, which we now know e-commerce returns is higher than in-store purchases. And so AI really being used to do all of that. Indeed. And we know that retailers are also doubling down on ways to get in front of the consumer with higher margin businesses like advertising. So what are you watching there? Yeah, Rochelle, watch out for Walmart Connect as well as Target's Round. Those are two retail media networks where they're ultimately taking their marketplaces and AI to boost their own ad business. And we know that that does bring higher margin returns as, as well as higher interest among consumers with those personalized ads. And so be on the lookout for that in 2024 as consumers really, uh, rather retail companies, really seek other ways to help boost that bottom line and ultimately ways to attract consumers to their sites. Certainly a lot vying for customers' attention. Appreciate you breaking that down for us. Our very own Brooke De Palma. Well, that does it for now. I'm Rochelle Akufo. I'll be back with you tomorrow. Stay with us on Yahoo Finance.